Welcome back to the Bear Podcast Show with me, Sean Scullion, aka the Handsome Stranger, Omal, aka the Bear, Aiden the Face for Radio behind the scenes, and today we're joined with Darren Linton, former Queen's Guard and now recovery coach. Mm-hmm. Welcome, Darren. Thank you. It's great to be here, and thanks for agreeing to have me on. Very welcome. Yeah. That is some statement. Queen's Guard recovery coach. There's a big, massive gap in between all of this, Darren. <laughs> we're going to go even. Yeah. Be- Further back before the, the, the Queen's Garden jump in. But before we get going, guys, just want to say to all you out there, if you're watching the videos, you're enjoying the content, can you please click subscribe so we can continue to bring you this awesome content. That's judged by me. But Darn, thank you very much for coming up. Um, Darn, let's start at the very, very start, where you're from, how, where, and then we're just going to go through this. Okay, so I am originally from North Belfast. I uh, don't live there now, but I, that's where I, I sort of grew up. Uh, I grew up in a place called Ballysillen. Um, a lot of my friends were from the Shankill, um, through school and cousins and family. Um, and that's where I, you know, still consider myself. I'm a Shankill roadman. You know, that's where I would say that I'm where I'm from when, when I talk about anything like that, you know. So that's that's originally where I grew up, you know. Um, yeah, that's just... Where do you want me to start around all this here? So, this is where, you know, it sort of goes. So then, Darren, when, when did you then, obviously you grew up in, in Ballyson or Shankill, and then you, you went off to the join the army. Was that was that so, way, yeah. or did you have Well, there's a bit of a story between sort of, right. you know, the growing up, and then obviously, you know, joining the military, you know. and So what was it like uh, growing up? And, and uh, I'm going gonna, gonna to certainly go into that, but can I say this before we even start? I think it's fair to do this, you know. I talk about, I'm okay with my story today, you know, I've done a lot of stuff that I'm certainly not proud of, and it's shameful, some of the behaviour and things that I've done. Um, I do talk about it today, you know, I look back, you know, laughing and sort of, but it's that's not the way, you know, other people have experienced it as well. So I just think it's fair to say that out loud, you know. So I grew up in the Shankill and uh, I was, <clears throat> I was a big sort of football fan, um, Loved uh, Linfield FC, you know, nothing to do with Linfield FC, I was just a supporter and, you know, um, we never got a lift over to the football grounds, um, over to Windsor, so I got myself involved in a wee crew over there, um, but just on the way over we used to start a drink and you get somebody to go into the wine lodge for you and this sort of thing, and, <coughs> excuse me, um, and the crew that I got myself involved in were were known as as Section F, which was a football hooligan group. They called themselves Section F because they were the closest you could get to the visiting fans within Windsor. So that sort of, um, and that's that violence and that sort of thing sort of just came naturally. It was an environment where I grew up. It just seemed to be happening everywhere. It was on the news. It just seemed to be okay to be involved in in this sort of stuff. You know. Now, the, the weird thing about it was is that I was extremely shy to to a, to a fault. So whenever I got a couple of beers in me, I thought I was the burr. I thought I was King Kong, you know what I mean? Um, so whenever all that sort of stuff sort of kicked off, I was able to get involved in things that really I shouldn't have been getting involved in at that age. Do you know what, what I mean? What age were you? Um, <clears throat> so I was probably around maybe 14, 15. Oh, shit. Right. Yeah, it was really... it was. My, my story starts quite young. I mean, my first experience of alcohol, I believe, it was about 11 or 12, where I, I had two younger brothers and my mum and dad had gone out for a wee drink and I uh, was asked to get up and mind the house while they were out for a wee drink. Um, so I went into the fridge. My mum had a box, a bo- a box of wine um, and there was, I got myself a wee tumbler and went over this wee box of wine and, and just, you know, by the time my mum and dad had come back, I was absolutely wrote off, you know, from the word, from the gacko, like, you know what I mean? From the word go, there's me laying on the sofa, they come in and, you know, and alcohol and violence are throughout my story, you know, up and up until a certain point, you know. Um, and when I think about that now, you know, nobody ever pulled me to the side and said, listen, Darn, you shouldn't be drinking like that or you shouldn't be doing that. It was a laughing stock. It was a laughing joke, you know, it was... Have you seen any pink elephants at all? I can't believe you didn't leave your mask on. And all. You know, this sort of, mm-hmm. there was a humour and a banter around it, you know. Um, so And that's okay. And that's certainly not anyone's fault with blaming anybody here, you know. But that was just, uh, once I took it, I just never, I just never stopped. So, yeah, moving forward to the football hooliganism. Whenever I got the drink in me, I was able to get involved in the 
the, the, the sectarian violence, if you want. Um, and, and I loved it. I'm not going to lie. I absolutely loved it. I would still go to Linfield matches um, at, at, at Christmas, like Boxing Day and stuff like that, you know, and... Although I don't get involved in any of the rowdy the stuff today, the boxing. I do. I do. You know, I sort of. I still feel that the hers and the neck and up a wee bit when I watch. Mm -hmm. You know, the sort of young people. Oh. Even though it's not anywhere near the way it was when I was growing up. The guy I, I went to. Uh, I went to Ellenfield match there. Wasn't that long ago with a few of my friends in recovery, and they. You know, all of us were just like. It's just. It's just so family orientated now. It's just not like that when mm. I was growing up. You know, my experience and probably the one that's the most the most sort of famous or infamous, if you want to put it that way, is uh, Linfield were playing Donegal Celtic in the Cup. And I, that day um, was just, you know, one of them days that as a kid, you know, and you're with all your friends and we're down, we got a couple of beers and you walk through the Belfast City Centre from the Shankle over, there was a bar at the bottom of the Shankle, we used to all meet all the Shankle ones in a sense, I mean, you would have got somebody going to carry out for you or whatever, a couple of beers, and then away you went, and then went to the City Hall, met some people there, and then we went over, we used to cut through a place in Sandy Row. Um, but there was like a sports shop over there as well, and I remember, like, this guy had absolutely no idea that we were all coming, and I don't know, there must have been 300, you know, people, young lads, all different different ages, um, and it was like a like a... Say a second hand sports shop for all, for all I remember, but it had a big cage, like a you know, something you'd find in Tesco's, and it was just full of golf balls. By the time we went through the town and went past that shop, all the golf balls had just I don't know where they went, they just disappeared, you know. Now, we then then obviously went over through Sandy Row over to over to Windsor, um, and we get into the we were sort of late getting in, um, just given the fact of there were so many and all this sort of stuff. But when we get in, I remember it was just a hate fest. That's what I, I just feel mm -hmm. when I when I recall and look back at that. It was just you know crazy times, you know. Um, about to the golf ball been a reappearance. <laughs> <laughs> just about to get into that. <laughs> right, so, you know? um, so what happened? But what I so there's if you went on to YouTube, you can, if you type in Linfield and Danny Gall Sally, it nearly comes up. There's a couple of you know videos, and there's actually a, 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 a like a video on the on the north stand where all the Linfield supporters were all running through. And I could nearly pick myself out as to where I was. And I remember that as well, you know. Um, and yes, the golf balls did make an appearance and people worked out very quickly that if you threw them, they would have bounced off the concrete and into the crowd a lot harder and faster, you know. And I remember watching that and I remember somebody had a bottle of champagne. I don't know how they got that into it. I don't know how they got that into the crowd, but it was being passed around, people drinking it and stuff, you know, in this, you know. Um... But if you went on to YouTube, you could see that, you know, and that's that was my experience of Windsor. That was my experience of maybe the troubles growing up, you know, um, and it was just it was just a, a lethal time. Not a very nice time. You know, if I thought for one minute that I had a, one of my sons was involved in that sort of stuff, I'd be, you know, distraught. And I would like to say I would do something about that. Yeah. But that was my early experiences. And it was and it seemed OK. It seemed like the most natural thing in the world to be involved in sectarian violence and hate and, uh, and all that sort of stuff, you know, singing songs that were very negative and, and all this sort of stuff, you know. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, it was just, that's, that Bar was Darn, that part of it growing up. for people who are watching or listening to that, that's the early 90s, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is the height. I think that's 92, 93, just, you know, a couple of years prior to the, the peace process. So just so people are aware, like, you know, we, Bally Sullen, very, very staunch, Shanko, very staunch Protestant area. It was a flashpoint. PEL, yeah, PEL, Protestant Unionist Loyalist is probably the best way to describe uh, so them just, areas. Just so people that, and this is, this is good in a way. This is great in a way. Actually, this is the, probably the best thing in a way. Some people now, not fully aware of, you know, younger ones watching now, not fully aware of all the history. And, and so it would have been like, it's a flat, it, like it, it was a, Northern Ireland was a cauldron back then in the early 90s. Like it was, you know, this wouldn't have been seen as anything on toward and it no. would have been like just one shot of violence intersection thing but like that there be belonging to a group your confidence coming out and drink you know like we've seen before people talk about hooganism it was a sense of belonging they were now in a group and they felt like this is you know, it, was just, it was a subculture yeah I, I mean i'm you know qualified youth worker today and work with young people and all that sort of stuff so when i was doing my degree we we talked about it and we actually had a a class around subcultures, part of the sociology, psychology side of things, 
and uh, it was it nearly forms your identity, nearly forms the person that you are, you know. And I, and I although I look back with that with nostalgia, you know, it was a it was a very negative time, but it was also like a a barometer of what was going on around, you know, in Northern Ireland and in in the country at that time. You know, there was an awful lot of sectarian violence, shootings, bombings, all that stuff was going on. You know, we're saying there about you know um, being in the I went on to be in the military, um, and I remember the soldiers on the streets. You know, I remember the <coughs> excuse me. I remember them coming around in the wagons, you know, and I've a couple of experience I'm, I'm happy to share. You know, I remember I was, I was, my father worked for, um, worked in the vans and he had a friend who was uh, a Catholic fella who was doing West Belfast. So I, he was, he paid, he paid me more than my dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I went out with him, you know, um, and I was up around sort of, you know, all this West Belfast, uh, the, the, the CRN community, you know, Catholic, Republican, Nationalist. Um, and I remember I was coming up, there was a place called Bally Murphy, and there was a wee spar just on the White Rock Road. And I was coming up after dropping off some sausages and bacon and stuff like that. And I remember, uh, I'm assuming, now I'm assuming it was like AK-47 fire at the the soldiers going down, you know, the, the road. And I remember, nobody even blinked an eye. I don't remember, and I'm like, you know, I remember going... It just this is just sort of something that happens, you know. Um, so that was the, that's one of the that's one of the things that I remember, and I remember that very well because I remember saying to the fella Bobby, you called the guy. Um, I said, "Did you hear that?" There, he says, "Hi." Oh. He says, "That's just you know," and he just went like that. Let's move a job to do. Let's get on. But this job was just life, you know. So I was only a young lad at that time, doing that on my summer holidays. Like, but it, but it's mad to think that that not not that it's normal, but that was the norm. That that was the norm. That, that you know I. I've come to terms today, you know, with the fact that my upbringing certainly it wasn't unique, but it's an experience that not everybody has had, you know, and, and, and there are probably people out there that have had these experiences that maybe won't speak out about it. So I don't mind talking about this stuff mm -hmm. because it's fair to say some of these things because this is what was going on, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it is, you are, you're right, John, like, the, the, you know, that wouldn't have been an unusual, like, if that was in any other civilised society now, and it would be different now, Unless we've come a long way, we're still there's a long road for for Northern Ireland, but we've come some some distance from. I remember the bollards at the bottom of the road. I remember the checkpoints at the top of the town and the uh, the way in, the way out. I remember they just pulled over and searching cars. I, I said in a previous podcast, I was lying in my bed. I was about six years of age, and the next thing, uh, the RUC come in and they're like, "Everyone up, just lift us out of the bunk." I was in the top bunk, lifted me up mm -hmm. out of the top bunk. Said, "Come on, son, we're going." And as we're on the way out, I'd said this to Sean. The bomb disposal team, we Johnny Five Alive, we called it the wee machine. The bomb disposal <laughs> team was there. It was a false, a false alarm, but it it it, it was experience as you all. You know, it's a core memory now. Mm -hmm. Something I'll always remember. We were at the very tail end of it. You know, you know, we 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 were ten and eleven years of age when the ceasefire was announced. You know, we 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 were only starting to become aware of what was going on, a divide, troubles, stuff like that. But even in the twenty years previous to that. Come some distance now, it's social media yeah. and 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 people integrating <coughs> and, and 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 meeting now and you know socialising the guy. It comes even Belfast. You can go anywhere in Belfast. And people are like, oh, should you watch? We there's still places in Belfast. I wouldn't want to roll in, you know, and you know, and you know yourself, you wouldn't want to roll it. It's, it's, it's there's still there's still the old grounds, but the city centre now, it's welcome to anyone. It is. It really is. You know, it's not like that. It's not. The way I remember, it's changed so much as well. You know, it's changed so much. But I, I, you can't not talk about some of the stuff oh, that, no, that no. happened mm -hmm. in my world. You know, without talking about that stuff. You know, that I have I seen when I was well, when I was a kid. Well, you know, Darn, it must have been a crossroads for you, because we know growing up in 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 flashpoints like that, there's there's roads you can go down, and and likely go down when mm. when you're from disadvantaged, you know, social disadvantaged backgrounds. There wasn't a wealth of jobs about. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of options. So when you're involved with that level of violence, the, the there's there's a hatred there and there's a there's a the, the flash and a, a belonging. You obviously had choices to make then. W what you were going to do, you could have went down paramilitary. You could have went to military. So you obviously had to make a decision then to say. So did you get any uh, run-ins with the police when when this? I remember, like I remember, you know, fighting with them and 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 you know, bricking them and stuff like that. There, with it when you were when you were in the in the the football side of things. But 
the decision for me, it was, there was a couple of things that formed my opinions when I, when I looked back. One of which was I had a family member who was in Long Cash, which was the prison for, yeah. you know, uh, uh, co combatants at that time. Um, and I remember my mum bringing me up to see him. And I was only young. And I remember going on this bus within within the cash where you, um, it didn't have any windies. And I remember being frightened. You know, was like, I, was, I was only young then. I don't know, I was really young then. Um, and got up there and not liking that, you know, uh, and that sort of thing. You know, my mum was always uh, very anti-paramilitary, um, as was my family, you know. Um, so, but my father was in the UDR um, at an earlier stage as a part-time part -time UDR guy. So I remember him coming back in his uniform and, and then obviously you see the the, the, uh, the the soldiers on the streets. So in my community, they were looked upon as, you know, these great fellas that were helping the community. You know, all the women liked them. You know, you were guys in uniform that were carrying guns. To me, that was like, oh, yeah, that's exciting. You know, so I decided, you know, at an early stage, probably about, about 15 and a half, I wanted to join the military. Um, and I wanted to go and do the best that I could. I had this, you know, potential that I, that I thought I was always fit. I was always able to run and jump. And I was, I was really good at sports and football and all this sort of stuff, you know, and really loved all that. Um, so I decided I went to I went to join the Royal Marines. Um, I'd done the PRC, so I went through the whole process. Uh, I went over to Limstone and done um, three days over there for the Royal Marine, the PRC. Uh, and what happened was, is I remember I was so young, I was so naive, you know. What age were you? Excuse me, I think I was only sixteen. I think I was only about sixteen. It's young for the Marines. I it's, I can't remember. So there was a, there was an age. Obviously, you've got to be a certain age. So it must have been you know sixteen there there thereabouts. Um, and I went over for the three. I remember, you know, we were walking from one part of the, the, the camp to the other and me, you know, shouting, so you want to be in the Marines? And all, you know, all this, you know. Yeah. And when I look back, I'm really scundered because I was saying that, you know, <laughs> and, I, and that's the way I see it now, you know. But I done well in the sense, so they bring you in at the end of the, the sort of three days and they say to you, listen, you know, you done well here, you done well, or you didn't do well here, you know. What they told me was my fitness was well up the standard. I was nearly, you know, second, third, when it came to a place called the Endurance Course, you know, if you see any of the YouTube videos, there's a place called Peter's Pools, and Peter's Pool you go in and there's a tunnel you go under and all, um, and it, it's fully submerged with water, you know, scurry. But mm -hmm. I, I just, all that stuff excited me, you know, and I think, you know, given the fact that I was a football hooligan at one point, that really, you know, a wee bit of balls about me, mm -hmm. you know, and it just, that stuff excites me, you know, I still, even when I think back to it now, you know. Um, but I ended up, they told me to come back in a year, so... Long story short, I didn't want to come back. Um, I didn't want to wait. I didn't want to, you know, um, take my. T I didn't want to take my time. I was still working with that fella Bobby in West Belfast, and I was doing. And I was just like, you know what? I want to. I want to get out and get out of the country and a lot of the trouble. I couldn't wait to get away. You know, I couldn't wait to get away and experience the world. My mum used to say that um, that Northern Ireland was too too small for me. You know, that was sort of the way I felt. You know, I had to get out and do all this stuff, and so away I went about my business. Um, I then had a friend who joined the uh, First Battalion Irish Guards, and he had said to me, "Listen, I was I was in the cadets as well with him. He was involved in that, um, and he had said to me, "Listen, would you, would you maybe consider the guards?" Um, and I was like, "Yeah, sure, why not?" And I went, and then I went through the process with them, and I went up to a place, Balamina, done the week course. You've got to hit a couple of times. Like it's, you know, nine minutes or ten minutes, whatever it is. You do mile and a half out. And your mile and a half back is then timed, and you, you've got to get a certain time to get. Like I wiped the floor with it, absolutely brilliant, you know. Um, and then obviously they offered me a position on that weekend. Sorry, I hit that wire there. <laughs> on that weekend, um, they offered me a position um, within uh, Purbright, uh, which was the training, the training facility for for all the guard regiments. So I was like, yeah, and it was only like three or four months down the line. So I think I was maybe around maybe say seventeen there thereabouts. Um, and I went over to a place called Purbright, um, and, and I love sharing this because this was, this was, um, I've, I've, I've recently been connecting with sort of ex-veterans and stuff like that there, and I was telling them, and they thought this was hilarious, because this is, this was my experience, it wasn't everybody's experience, but as I went up to, there's a place called Brookwood, where you get off the train, you then go around to the first, the first sort of checkpoint in the, in the, in the, in the barracks, um, and there was this sort of like a, maybe like a shelf, like this here, and there was a guy there waiting and all those coming. So you come with your paperwork and a shirt and tie and all that sort of stuff. So I went up and I put my elbows onto this shelf and 
here, mate, I'm here to join the army, you know, pure Belfast. And just, <laughs> get fucking standing up now, he says, that, you know, he just fucking lifted me. I remember, st- you know, fucking heard all was getting back and all, you know, that real, you ever see like cartoons? That's exactly how I remember that, like, you know. And, uh, and he remembered me. He remembered me in the sense of, you know, on the way through, you know, no elbows that he used to yeah. get into me. And that was like a real, you know, you know when you get something on somebody oh. or you got a stick, you know, that's exactly what happened. So <clears throat> I went into the, so you, as part of the, the guards training, you do 10 weeks initially. It, it may be different now. I don't know what it is now. But you've got to do 10 weeks in Purbright, which is, you know, a lot of people refer to it now, ex-guards and stuff, University of Purbright. So in the University of Purbright, you then have 10 weeks there. And then obviously you go on to your specialised infantry training. I done the 10 weeks there, you know, absolutely. It was tough. It was really hard. It was, you know, I remember things, um, they had this this sort of hill, had these hills where there was a start point and a finish point, And there were so many, like they called them the sisters, you know, and you had to get over these sisters within, I think it was 18 minutes. I'm nearly sure it was 18 minutes, but you had your weapon and you had your weapon and your helmet on and stuff like that. And I remember, you know, giving it, and I remember, you know, you were busted, like, it's, you know, your heart was pumping out of your chest and this stuff. They also had a place called, Har- any ex-guardsmen who've been to the University of Purbright will, will recognise these places. You know, there was a, well, a hill called Heartbreak, which was straight up and then straight down, and you had to keep doing it till they stopped, they stopped you. They had a, a thing called the 10 Second Hill, the Sand Hill, you know, you know, and they were the fitness side of things. We also then obviously had all the marching and all that sort of stuff. And I remember you had a, you had a, when you were marching to ingrain it into your system, you had to then refer to it, you know, when you were marching, you had to, you know, count as you were saluting trees and this sort of thing, you know, just to get these things that you were learning, you know. So you became really good at that sort of stuff. Check one, two, and all this, you know. And if you were out late at night, say on exercise, you're coming back to the barracks, people were in bed, you the, the sergeants would make you do it a couple of times. You know, to wake everybody up and yeah. stuff, you know. Lethal, absolutely lethal, you know. Um, so, yes, I then went from there to... Uh, At night time, you were coming marching back. They would have brought you back. And yeah, then. I was talking about sisters and stuff oh. like that, yeah. So that, they were just sort of the endurance things that you were building up your fitness and you built up to that, you know, on the ranges. And, all. and I just, I was so focused. I just loved it. I just, you know, it was just something I, in your, in your mind, you have this vision of what it's going to be like. You know, and that's exactly what it was like. You know, now there was dark times in that, in, in the sense as well, where you know the sergeants would have come in and they would, you know, you would have. I remember there was a. It nearly takes a bit of description, but at the top of the lane, the lanes is what you call the sort of army barracks and where you live. Um, in a sort of there'd be four beds in one square, you know, and there'd be, you know, four squares. So what's that? Four, eight, sixteen, you know, soldiers in one, you know, trainee soldiers or recruits as it was then. Um, in the, and they would have said to you, right, you've got to change squares as to where you were living. So all your, so you had all this kit, you had all this, you know, everything that you have, your all your civilian gear, everything had to move from one place to the other. And then you would have had an inspection, you know, like a, maybe an hour or two after that. Um, so you were just, you were just focused. You never had a chance to think of anything else, you know. Then the, the, it got worse where you then had to go down the stairs to the other you know, it was it was lethal. It was absolutely lethal that amount. And you'd been sitting up half the night, you know, polishing your boots and learning how to do all that. And um, you had to have this uh, in your locker. You had to have this, like all your wash kit, you know, your, and you weren't allowed to use razors. It was, uh, not razors, um, like shaving foam. It was more, you know, the old state. My dad still has one, you know, that flipping yeah. bean brush and stuff yeah. like that. So that had to all be sitting spotless on a towel and all your T-shirts had to be, you know, squared off and all this sort of stuff and all. And that stuff used to drive me up the wall. I'm not going to lie to you, I really struggled with all that. <laughs> you know, that's, that wasn't, you know, um, what I had to do. But I will say this, you know, uh, in terms of when you got things wrong over there, um, and particularly in the earlier days, they, they jailed you or they used to lock you up, okay? So being locked up with the military then at, as a recruit, you're marched down to the guard room. Mr, you know, who remembered me with the, with the elbows on the shelf used to be there. And he used to do the horriblest things to He used to give you this, um, they were called buffers, as, as I remember. I haven't seen any for quite some time, but they, they were cut in half. So you then had to get down onto your knees, like a stress position, and you had to move these like this, you know, and like polish the floor and go from one side to the other. And I tell you, my legs used to be on fire, you know. And then he used to get you up and you would have had a hold, you know, like up two bars of sort of used soap um, or matches, 
on your fingers like this here, out like this. And you were, you know, <laughs> you know, so it was things like that there. It was all sick a lot. And then I would have shout at you and you've got, uh, the but you to bring into the yard. So it was a whole range of stuff like that there. And you didn't want to go back. You just didn't want to go back down to the guard room at all. You know, I had a, at today, I would have took the, the, the civilian jail over, <laughs> yeah. over going to the guard room any day of the week. Like, you know, so, so yeah, so I passed out of there. A big proud day. Mum and dad over, family over. You know, I had a six pack at that. It's probably the only time in my life I had a six pack. You know, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and we had a we had a, 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 a like a parachute regiment PT, and he was he was he was probably one of the worst guys I ever came across in the military. He used to he used to get us to climb ropes and stuff like that there with backpacks on, and uh, he was just I thought he, I, I think he just enjoyed it. He just was evil, <laughs> you know. But I'll tell you something now. When I finished them ten weeks, I was in top condition. You know, in terms of fitness, endurance. And all this sort of stuff, and I had learned, you know, all about the the, the guard regiment. You've got to memorize, you know, um, military history. So sometimes when you were holding the soaps or you were down doing the, he would have said to you, right, I want you to regurgitate some of the military history, particularly relating to your regiment. The Irish Guards Cap Star is an eight pointed star with the, uh, the, the St. Patrick's Cross, and the, the most illustrious order of St. Patrick. You know, I remember some of the stuff I still remember, yeah. do you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, that was that was sort of th that first ten weeks tough. Yes, did we lose a lot of people? There was forty five people started. You know, when I came to the second part of training, and when we passed out, there was eleven originals, and there was oh, there were seventeen in the in the platoon, but there was only eleven originals, and thankfully I was one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, now I'll talk a wee bit about that second phase of training. You know, because it's just it's fair to say. You know, that's just up there. It was all about the drill. You know, we everywhere we went, it was March, it was your boots were getting for, forever getting layered up with polish. You know, um, because you're bringing this stuff with you to a battalion. You know, this isn't you just get this gear and it's you know, you're giving this, it's yours, you've got to look after it, you know, all the way through your career, you know. Um and up there it was all the all the really nitty gritty stuff, the infantry school, you know, Catterick. Um, you know, people talk about sort of the the parachute regiment doing the likes of P Company and stuff, you know, some of the things that they would have done with MP Company, we would have done. You know, within there was a place called the Steeplechase, um, and I remember my one of the, the the defining days within you know infantry school, if you want, was the being at fighting day. Now it sort of lasted a couple of you were sort of built up to this, but the last day I think it was a Thursday or a Friday. Um, I'm not really sure it was a Friday, but on that morning when you get up, you know this is going. Nobody tells you on the even on the schedule, the day's blank, right? So you know this is happening. You don't know what's going to happen. But you have a fair idea, you're going to get beasted from here to there, you know. And I remember we went around with our web and our weapon and our helmet, you know, we dropped all our gear. We were just in, you know, your jacket and your thing and your boots. And they pulled us through, you know, muck and we crawled and they're shouting at you, you're scum, you're this, you're that, you know, ah, you know, all this sort of stuff. Like, I, I heard somebody saying, it's like a, you know, a hell week. You've got hell week in the Navy SEALs, this is a hell day, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's things that I remember. I remember being in the river after all that sort of beast and you're, you're, I'm so angry, you know, you're so, I didn't realise how angry I could get, you know, this is sort of bringing this out, this is a day that's facilitated, you know, um, and we were up there, so we're in a river, um, and you're up there about, maybe you see your thighs, and you've got to go round this sort of part of the steeplechase, um, with your weapon, and your bayonet on, and you're, ah, you know, you're squealing and shouting, and you're, and then you start running, the, they pulled me out of the river, um, by the, so the, by the, by the, say the webbing, and they give me a bit of a doing, they give me a bit of a kicking. Um, and I said, right, away you go. And there's guys sort of guiding you in the sense of where you've got to go. So you, there's dummies and different things and bang, you know, ah, I'm bad and all that sort of stuff, you know. And it's just, your throat's nearly going, you know, and you're, I was busted. But the last thing that I remember about it, um, of, of part of that, that sort of, we, it was only a short course. And part of it was through a river where you had to crawl, you know, through the river. So you were soaked to the skin and all that sort of stuff. Um, but part of the steeplechaser was like these two like spikes with like circle cylinder wooden, you know, uh, what are they like, say, like, uh, what do you call them, poles, you know. Uh, telegraph poles. Telegraph poles, telegraph poles, that's what they were like, sort of chopped down. So you then had to jump over that into like a, a big puddle and the puddle went up to my knee. But what I didn't know was, and I'd done this a couple of times, you know, in training and, you know, previous to this, is they had filled it with petrol or diesel. And as you jumped in, they fucking lit it. And I was like going through the fire, you know, it was like a like a baptism of, you know, and that was coming near the end of the training. So once you get through, and I remember us all being like in a pig pen, you know, this is not 
YouTube. <laughs> this isn't this is not something you'll find anywhere. You know, it's part of the training in a sense. Um, so we're all there. We're told to drop all our kit, your helmet, everything comes off, and there's you know whatever amount there was, maybe the seventeen of us say. And uh, the, the the sergeant just goes right last man standing, and it was a fucking digging match, an absolute digging match, you know. And it's just and now old football who I just you know got right back and I was here we'll fucking go you know and I just get stuck <laughs> in like you know. But I have to say this out loud, you know, and I, you know I have to be fair to to to, to 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 myself here, you know. I lost him about five minutes. A big guy <laughs> just came in rugby, big a Welsh guard just go over and rugby tackled me. And uh, and I landed on the deck, you know. Uh, but there was a, an actual Welsh guard that actually won that. You know, he was a rugby player and stuff like that. But we're all standing there, you know, noses over here, <laughs> black eyes. And you couldn't have hung back, there. could you? <laughs> no, you <laughs> couldn't have hung back. Let them all dig in first, <laughs> and then just pick your pick your your shots off. Well, I think it was like a release of tension. You know that anger you're just built up, and people go to the gym and do all that. There, it was just like get stuck in. You know, get it out of you, do you know what I mean? There was no weeps on the ground booting you or, you know, jumping all over you in a sense. Yeah. But it was just that sort of bunch of men getting stuck in each other. And, and you know, so if I met any of them now, we'd be talking about that stuff. It's the stuff like that there that you remember, you yeah. know. So that's the sort of, you know, all that do sort you of... imagine getting 45, 17-year-olds now together? Mm-hmm. See, if you shouted at them when they come put their elbows in the thing, you would have no 17-year-olds left. Yeah. Like they've got so soft, like but you know that's what I mean. Way, and it's yeah. young, but I'd say that fairly. I wonder if they still do that. I would love to know if they. I would love to go and watch them, okay, what prob- they do now. You know, I don't. I don't listen. I don't think they do. I don't probably, think some of that stuff. I uh, with the legalities of things. Yes. Now and and, uh, and what happened to you there? You stubbed your toe. Here, there's a wee sticky plaster. Uh, do you want six, uh, six weeks? You know, do you want a pop? We pop or, roll one here for you. <laughs> or, or or the sergeant called me a name <laughs> <laughs> on the but, phone to your man. I want out of here. You know. But we've well touched on on the soft generation. Now and this mm-hmm. is this is the problem. We're gonna if we ever have to send someone to war, it's, it's gonna be the stub tool brigade. But they, y- you would have matured very quickly there. I would agree. My, my is that your first time away from home? Yeah, that was about, well. I I as a well, it was ten or eleven. I was part of the Belfast kids as well. Where you know, uh, I think it was ten, ten kids from Shankill, ten kids from Bally Murphy. America. Went away to America for six weeks. So it was I on that. Is that right? Uh, That's see that there. That was a brilliant. And I it went was away ten or eleven years. P seven, I think. P seven was right. Okay, so yeah. there, there about just before I took my first drink. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I remember, yeah, six weeks away. So that was my first time. Away. But it never, it never, it never bothered me. You didn't come back with American accent or anything? No, nope, your brother. Uh, he did. He, he did. came back with American accent. And you know, for three years after it, anything you want to do, if you want to go fishing, oh, I done that. Where'd you do that? In America. Anything you <laughs> done, he done it in America. He crammed a lot in six weeks. But I always laugh at this. He went off and he stayed, just to, sorry, I didn't say, he stayed with this family that owned an ice cream company. So they were well to do and they were taking me in there. That cub got to come over here for six weeks. Oh, holy fuck, he got the wrong end of that. <laughs> you know, so he's away to Minnesota. He's off to American football games. He's doing this. He's living the life. And then that cup got to come over to cook time. <laughs> but, uh, Here's a ball, away you go. But you're young then. And then yeah, yeah. You, you're off. It would, it, it would, it 17, would. 17, uh, 17 and a half. They're thereabouts, you know. Um, I, I think I joined, it was 90, let me see, 95, 95. I joined July 95. See, see, when you do the infantry training, you're in the guard, so obviously mm-hmm. you you're already lined up to go to guards. You don't. It's not like you do the training and then you pick where you're going. No, you pick a regiment before you go in. Yeah. So you do, and you get your military number. You know, before you go in, so you pick. If you want to go to Paris, you you know, or you want to go to Royal Marines. You you know, everywhere has their own training site and their own guys. You know, doing that and stuff like that. It's it's like a later in the battalion, I found out that it was like a. So when you're um, going for rank and stuff like that, it's nearly part of the deal where you become a, sec- a sergeant or a section commander or whatever it is. You then have to go back to the training regiment and, and train guys through the 10 weeks, whatever it is. And obviously that gives you that experience of working with you know, new guys, training them how to you know march and shoot and you know do all the like, cleaning and tidying and discipline and, and all that sort of stuff, you know, so... Well then, you obviously then it's a big day. The passing out parade, it's it's a big thing. It's a proud moment. Some, f- something nobody can take off. Yeah, I love that. I love I love things like that. You know, nobody can ever say that like, you you know that's that's mine. You know, and as nostalgic as the M days war, you know, it was to get, it was to go away, but you know, it's shame in the sense of what I done in the sense later later down the line. The day you passed out, you like you'll remember that vividly. Very vividly, yeah. My mum and dad was there, you know, you're polishing your boots, you know, 
for a couple of days, you're you know you're training. You're probably doing this for a week prior to, you know, everybody coming over, and you know you can't wait because we were actually getting a couple of weeks leave, you know, before you um, after you passed out. I was going back to Northern Ireland after being away for what three whatever it is, fifteen weeks, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, um, I remember my auntie came up as well, and she she bought me a camera. <laughs> she bought me a camera. So she did for all the journeys. It was going to go on and all, you know, as a, like sim symbolically, you know. Um, and I remember, you know, when we were marching over, there was tunnels and stuff like that there. And the, we don't, the, the, the British military don't do the shouting and the singing the way the Americans. But for some reason, our sergeant decided to, to say this before. And we were going through these tunnels. I can't remember what we were singing, but there was things, you know, like a, is it a cadence or something to call it, you know? Uh -huh. So we were doing some of that. So it was just like a wee thing, that you know, the GE up. Mm -hmm. But every one of us, I remember us all being super proud. You know, there was a guy who had been in the Gulf War who left, he was a medic, or, a, you know, some sort of medical um, guy, and he had a, a, a medal for being in, in the Gulf. So when he was passing out, obviously none of us, none, nobody had a medal. So when you were sort of inspected by... The, the big generals over whoever it was turned up that day. He st I remember he was only two down from me. I remember I'm talking to him. Where did you get that? And, you know, how did you, you know, why are you going back to the infantry and all this sort of stuff? And it was something that he was just inspired to do, you know, prestigious as it was, going to the guards and, you know, the queen and, the, and all this sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, two weeks off, um, hearing and turn, <laughs> as I call it, you know, on the drink, a uh, lot of, you know, yeah, just, a, just being a lad. It's probably the best way to put it, you know. I don't want to go into too much detail around that, but when you're let out of all this discipline, you there's releases that you need. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, had a bit of fun, um, and then I went to uh, Chelsea Barracks. So they pay for your flights and all that sort of stuff. So we're flying over to Heathrow, um, getting a bus. I got on a bus um, to the to the tube. The tube, I remember being a complete. Couldn't have told you where I was going. How do you ask people and all that sort of stuff? I got off um, the tube in a place called Sloan Square, and I didn't know where I was. I'd, know, I'd, know I'd never been to London, so I had no idea where I was. And I got on another bus to go down to the Chelsea Road. So it actually turned out it was on the bus for 300 metres. <laughs> it was only down the road, you know. But I remember turning up um, to, the, to the battalion, and there was a couple of things I remember about that. When you're in training, you have to pull your feet in, is what it's called. So you, you, know, you sort of stop and you slam your foot in like this here. Um, when you're in battalion, you don't do that. So me being, the, the Irish Guard refer to them as red arses, right? Um, so I being, me being a red arse, you know, I then went over to the guard room, pulled my feet in, and your man says, oh, you're only here to train her, aren't you? Like, you mm -hmm. just, you know, there was none of the elbow stuff yeah. or anything like that there, you know what I mean? Uh, so, uh, so yes, that's that's exactly what happened. Um, and then he, so, so what had happened as well with the battalion, the battalion was away somewhere, Um I can't remember where for the life of me. It could have been Northern Ireland. It could have been Kent, it could have been anywhere. I have no idea where the war. But the, those that were there were like what considered rear guard, um, and a lot of them. Not there was enough a lot of them, but there was a few there, a few bad apples. Let's just say. So whenever I first joined battalion, I then get in with the bad apples, straight away. You know, didn't know any better. I was still a wee bit naive as as, as such. You know, uh, big drinkers and all that sort of stuff. Um, was there drugs? Yes, there was drugs there as well. Um, and being someone who grew up in a sense of the the rave scene, you know, ease and speed and trips and all that sort of stuff was okay by me. It didn't really bother me. Um, and yes, did I take... Yeah, I did. Yeah. I, I, I dabbled a wee bit, you know. Um, but that was the fun times. And I look back at that. You know, it wasn't... It was to get a lot worse, obviously. You know, so join the battalion. You then get... When you arrive in battalion, you get your burskin. You get your red tunic, you get your trousers, we have these dungaree type things and you've you know, you get just for the people that don't know, the Irish Guard protects the Queen. That's mm -hmm. your red coats, the high uh, you know uh, they're called the red coats are called tunics. 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 But they're the ones you'll see and on the still the more old school parade, still them um, values, mm -hmm. still you know what is it? The changing they do like a changing of guard yes, and all. So, and so there's still that so, still happens, doesn't it? Yep, so Chelsea Bar because we were we were based there. That's our job as a battalion, and there was also coal streamers and uh, I think Scots guards were there as well. So you're sort of chopping and changing. So you do when you do Windsor Castle was forty eight hours. Um, St James's Palace was, um, I think it was only twenty four. Uh, same as Buck House, Buckingham Palace um, was was, was twenty four hours. So you're six on. Six on, uh, sorry, four off, two on, 
So and that's all the way right through, you know. So you could be out in the middle of the night, you know. But at a certain time, you obviously you put combats on. You're not in the, the tunics, you know, throughout yeah. the, the night time, mm -hmm. you know. Um. So I love doing Windsor Castle. I I never even as a grown up in Belfast, I never even heard of Windsor Castle. Didn't even know what Windsor Castle was. So when I first arrived, obviously I get through the gates and there's you know you've got to pay in as a tourist and all now, and obviously then you go up and there's places in Windsor Castle that I remember to this day. I don't know why you can get to see these. As as uh, as a civilian, but there was a place at the back, and I, I nearly think it was was a four pole, five pole, whatever it was, but it went right up the sort of the side, um, and you went right up to it was like um, so in Windsor Castle there's like and, and everybody will know this, but there's like laser beams, um, that as as soon as um that laser beam is broke, you know you've got a squad, you've got the QRF coming out of the, the soldiers coming out, and then you've got obviously the the milit uh, the police and all that, so, so there's a whole range of security around it. When you go up, you're actually told where some of these are. So you need to go to a certain point. And I remember going up during the day when you were on there. There was there's twelve uh, like statues, if you want, in the Queen's back garden. <laughs> but on the night time, there's thirteen, and that's there's something really. You talk about we're talking about paranormal there, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, um, that that's really trippy when you see that. You know, and people are winding you up because it's probably the darkest part of the castle. You know, people are wearing, you know, you better watch yourself up there and all, you know, it's, you know, and you, and you have all that sort of, you know. <laughs> what do you mean, the 13? So, a... so, there's, when you can, so when you look at it in the dark, whatever way it looks, the there's, there's must... 12 in the daytime and on the nighttime there's 13 statues you can see. And that's, that's a legitimate thing. That's honestly, you, I don't know why you can Google that or whatever, but that's, that was my experience and you can, you can count them, you know. Yeah. Um, we used to go up as far as a, there was like a, a, a Sunday, a Sunday is where you sort of went to, you know. And where you could, so in Windsor as well, there was a lot of like bars and all. So if you were doing a Saturday night, you could have been, you know, watching. I mean, there's guys coming back saying they've seen this fella doing this with this wee girl, you know, in the coming out of clubs and whatever else, you know, because they don't know where you are, you see, yeah. up in the castle, you know, obviously, you know. Um, but yeah, the, f the food in Windsor Castle was amazing. I remember the food in Windsor Castle being phenomenal, you know. Um, and, you know, everybody's in the one big room. And you'll see YouTube videos where guys are. You know, there's sort of the, there's a couple of troops that are changing the guards where you're going down or going up, um, and tourists love an old selfie and they love you know and there's Check my you, 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 like you, they can't get in the way of the Queen's Guard. They just can't do it. You're just not allowed to do that. And we have the right then to push you out of the way or run over the toppy technically. And there's many YouTube videos where I've seen. Mm -hmm. They just you know if you've got somebody from you know Japan or somewhere who doesn't speak English and not not sure of the cultural side of things over there, you know it just yeah, they just get rammed over, you know, mm -hmm. and that's just the way it is. You know, you just need you can't get in the way of the Queen's Guard. You just can't. I say the horse. The horse. Well, that's 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 the so the the blues and royals and all of the horses, the horsey yeah. guys. You know, yeah. I never seen too much of them to be fair. Um, there was a couple in the training with me, but once they went to a different, yeah. uh, secondary side of things, well, because they had the horse training and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Not that I know anything about that. Uh, to be fair, I wasn't part of that. See, when you're in winter, did you see many of the royals? I. I was I was very lucky. I seen uh, Char Prince Charles, King Charles now today. I seen Diana, um, the one who was there all the time. Not Andrew Edward, Prince Edward seemed to be there all the time. Um, he was always walking across the grass and <laughs> in his in his shoes and stuff like. That. And he, he would have waved at you to be fair. Every one of them. Now there was a particular post, uh, long post. Um, I, I can't remember the, the numbers obviously, but there was one that was like a, it looks right down. If you look at. Uh, you, during the, the, the death of the Queen, when Prince William, Prince Harry and stuff that come out, there's a big walkway oh, aye, the big all the way walk right walk down walk. it. So just before you go in there, there's two posts, one of them, one of which I've done many a couple of times. And I done it on a on a Sunday morning. Um and what happens when the royals are about is the police will come over to you and say to you, listen, such and such is about, you know, um, just because you've got to give a present to arms and this sort of thing, you know, you've got to obviously, you know, do what you gotta do. Um, and I remember the Queen coming out in the wee black car and she waved at me. And I remember, no, as a, someone from a shy, like, yeah. fuck me, she just waved at me yeah. like her, you know, I remember that. Do you have and to, that's keep, a a, real, that's a have real, to keep a decorum or can you wave Yes, back? you have to, yes. No, so, well, um, so the, the highest honour you can get from uh, from the guards or from the soldiers is a, pre is a present arms. Yeah. So you present your arms to you know the king or the queen. That's, well, that's, a, that's when a big, you put the that's a big up thing. And then push it out. Yep, so, you have, so it'll start up here on, yeah. on a slope arms and then you move it. Like that, there, and you're like presenting your arms to to the the dignitary, whoever that may be. 
you know. So yeah, like Queenie, you know, and that's, and that's a great memory from, to have for me. It's yeah, some anyway. distance from flinging our, our golf ball in Windsor to, <laughs> to saluting the Queen on the way out. <laughs> Without a doubt, we didn't hear this, but we didn't hear this. So although there was good times, and I, I mean, I, I sort of went over to the Falkland Islands. I was in the Falkland Islands. I was in Oman. Was it, I was you in were, Kenya. But that was post war. Was that yes, so post, yeah. Oh, I, right, I okay. never even so much as got a medal. You know, okay. at that time, I had to give my right arm to go into a theatre of war. You know, now, looking back, my God, am I glad right. that I didn't. So you were saying, and we've we've all seen, I've been actually at Windsor, and there's something about Windsor, the town itself, it's just impressive. It's a wee old school, the castle in the middle. There's something, and, and it's, it's, look, listen, it's a funny thing here, uh, in Northern Ireland, and especially me and John grew up in the National Housing State, and it's a funny thing, you know, but my 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 grandfather served 28 years in Staffordshire Regiment, which at the time was, you are like, Jesus, there's not many Catholics went over and served in the thing, but what actually happened was, do you remember they used to, the farms, they used to send you over the for, to work on farms, there wasn't enough work here and the, the money to feed a big family, so he was sent off to a farm and he came walking down one day and he seen... <laughs> He's seen a recruitment office and your man telling him how much they were making. He says, that's it. Signed up. And then the next thing, World War started. So it wasn't really exactly the luck that he had. But uh, he, uh, so the, the, there's a certain part of the prestige, the the the, the pants of it, you know, the, the show. Oh, it's well. it's and, and it's impressive. Like even to this day, it's impressive. And, you know, we'll not go so sideways into some 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 of the, the the recent things that have pulled it into this but even and then even in the the queen's passing the my, my father actually met the queen on in RAF um Peterborough in RAF Peterborough because my my auntie was married to the base commander and he was out my old boy always believes, goes mad at this because no one believes him he was out walking the dog and they stopped the car and asked him what type of dog it was and, and things. She's mad. she loved dogs. And he's like, nobody will believe me. <laughs> but there must have been, when you're involved in that and you're inside that, the intrigue in that. You're only 18, 19 years, 17, 18 years of age. But at the same time, you're out. You're now, you're, you're out there. You're earning money. You're with these ones are obviously older. The partying scene starts. You're just, it's just like a, you know, when you first join battalion and you sort of get into a crew and you're in your, you know, there's a, there's a range of stuff that I could go into just about the initial, you know, there's, there's initiation when you go in and you're, you know, you're pulled in, you're filled in and all that sort of stuff and you got to get a, a couple of drinks and all that sort of stuff. But there was also, there was also things that happened. So if I, if I go into just a wee bit of some of the negative behaviour, because this, this would be fair to say, um, and it leads into obviously sort of later in the show. Um, uh, later in the in the podcast, um, I just seen show there. That's why I'm saying <laughs> show, the, the show, you know. Uh, but so I I went to Kenya, um, with with and it was a you know it was all, it wasn't sort of the the tunic stuff. It was all the soldier inside of things, you know. A lot of people maybe think that the guards are are not soldiers. You know they are. We're 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 all trained soldiers. You know what I mean? Without a doubt, very professional as well. Um, and I went. I went to Kenya. So one of the courses that I'd got myself on was a radio course you know, or a signaler. If you're in the military, so I was a B two signaler. And one of my roles over in Kenya was to you know mind a, a part of the road where the ranges were. So not that there's an awful lot of cars, but civilians just wouldn't have got this experience. So it's I don't mind sharing this because I've shared it a number of places. You know, I've shared it. Um, so long story short, anyway, I like to be a wee smoke a weed. Okay. Um, and what I had done is I went out and met a couple of, of the wee guys um, who were selling it. And over there, you know, they, you bought it rolled and it was in like 10p mix of paper. That's the way you sort of bought it, you know. So I bought two of these um, and had hid them in my jacket. And when I was going into this, you know, this uh, garden of where, it was in the middle of nowhere. And there was, a, there was a house and there was a few hills and it was like a T-junction. So I was just stopping any traffic or anybody from walking over there. I think I had two, three people all day, you know, the whole eight hours, whatever it was, I wore. So I packed lunch and all with me. I had my weapon, I had rounds on me. I had my, my bayonet, the big, big knife, and anybody doesn't know what a bayonet is. I had all that on me, you know, I just had my barrier, I didn't have, you know, my helmet. Um, and I remember there was these mountains behind me. And when I first arrived there, probably about half five, six o'clock in the morning, it was misty and it was sort of, it had that sort of, it was like a humid, but like in rain in the night before, it was a lovely smell. And I remember seeing things like, you know, uh, elephant footprints on the ground and this sort of thing. So um, 
when the sort of mist started clearing, these these sort of mini hills sort of started appearing. And on the hills, as the, as the mist started coming down, or going away, uh, there was this big bunch of baboons. These things. And they're not friendly, flipping things, looking. And I remember, so I just, as soon as I arrived, in my head, I was like, if I smoke one of these, as soon as your man drops me off, nobody's going to be coming to see me. So I just smoked one of these flipping Kenyan weed reefers, right? <laughs> these, <laughs> these flipping baboons, these baboons, these baboons. Were they real baboons? Or <laughs> do we know? Were, listen, I tell you what, they were very real. They were very real. <laughs> and they just come down off this can. hill. They just come down off this hill. And they just sort of come down. And I remember the, the paranoia and stuff like that there and all that. I was like... I have a couple of sa- I, this is my thinking, right? I have a couple of sassy rolls in my backpack here. These fucking baboons are going to take the <laughs> sassy rolls off me, right? So where's me like that? I'm nearly r- ready to rock my wet and start blasting a few baboons over a couple of sassy rolls. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But thankfully, thankfully that didn't happen. They sort of give me a wide berth, but they're not friendly things. Uh-huh. They're just not, well, they're you know. And them, yeah, they're things. flipping like really. They're scurry looking things. Oh. And because there were so many of them, you know, I remember going to myself, like, I need to be very careful with these things. You know, thankfully they give me a wide berth, but I never forget that as long as I live. You'd never have got that, you know, as a civilian. Can you imagine, like, from the shankle to standing with a group of baboons coming past you? Like, you can... <laughs> <laughs> hey, look at us here. Hey, do you want to be puffing? <laughs> <laughs> Touch my sausage roll and I'll fucking ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, in my head, I was going to the Section F header when I come in, sort of pull the bait on me, start putting stalling, you know, and getting wired into these things over a couple of sassy rolls, like, you know, oh, my God. The, but that's, you know, I, I know, like I say, I laugh at stuff like that today, yeah. but, you know, as a servant soldier at that time, there's an element of that that I sort of, that's not the way I should have been behaving, you know, and I know that today, you know what I mean? And, it's, and it wasn't anybody else's fault, it was just the way I was, I was, you know. Um, I will say this, there was a... Um, one of the, the tribal guys came along, um, I forget the name of them now, had this sort of Maasai warrior, like a Maasai yeah. warrior who came along, he was in his bare feet, and he came over and he asked me for a cigarette, and he asked me, he asked me for smoke and fire. Um, he went like that, smoke and, and fire, you know, so he wanted a fag and he wanted a light, and I gave it to him, and as soon as he came over to me, he was close to me, he had flies all on his head, and I remember the flies coming on to me, you know, and me going like this here, and I'm like looking at me really strange, you know, and I took a cigarette and away he went about his business. But I remember sort of like, you know, looking at him and he had the, you know, the dress and he was so dark skinned, obviously, you know, with the sun and whatever, you know. So things like that, civilians just never would have, just no. never would have, mm-hmm. would have had them experiences, you know. Um, and Kenya was a lot of fun. Kenya was a lot of fun. There was a wee bit of hearing and turn out there. They have big, big bottles of beer, probably the same size of a Nuki Brown Ale is probably the way I seen it. It's called Elephant Beer. And this stuff was flipping lethal and it was... It must be a leader battle, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You know, um, and there's an awful lot of, uh, there's a wee town there that we went to. Um, before, well, I'm not going into too much around that there, but there was, you know, there was women there and it was a lot of fun. You know, let's just put it like that, you know. Um, young lads, <laughs> single, 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 single lads. 18 lad. years of age, right in Kenya. You know, that's it, you know, took, took full advantage uh, of all. I like all, a bit of all, coffee in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> all, all that was on offer, you know what I mean? Uh, so, so yes, that's, 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 that's to be fair to say. How long was the tour in Kenya? So it was only six weeks. So it was six weeks, but it was all, it was all ranges and it was all that sort of stuff, you know, um, we did, uh, there's a cracker photo uh, that I have where I had get in behind, it took me about half an hour, but we got off the, the four ton trucks and there was these uh, cheetahs um, and I, the way they were sort of lying, they were lying, there was like a hill coming down, I guess it was lying there. So I sort of went round this and I gave my mate the camera and I said, listen, if I can get in behind this, get a picture. It took me about half an hour to get in behind it, but the I, I'll send you the picture because mm-hmm. it's an absolute, it's one of my favourite pictures. Um, and I obviously, you know, had her and all then as well, you know what I mean, young lad and, and uniform. But I'm right in behind, I'm probably about maybe, you know, 30 centimetres from the back of a cheetah in behind that. So experiences I got there, we shank them off. Mm-hmm. Do you know, and I remember going around seeing the elephants and, you know, that sort of safari. It was like a bit of a boyhood dream as well. You didn't think you're going to get to see all this stuff, yeah. you know. But I remember us sitting as well in the night time. There was, you know, we had, the, we had the sort of light fires and stuff like that there when you're sort of doing the camp. But we were out in the, in the ground, you know, there was... And things run about. <laughs> There's things run about out there. And we were late and far. And I remember, you know, being very cautious, you know, when I was going to my tent and all of something coming out of a, a bush and all. Um, there was bushes over there that used to, we used to grab you and, and your clothes. We used to call them bastard bushes. I had no idea what they were. But they don't look dangerous. But if you go over, it'll just catch your clothes and it like nearly rips your clothes. You know what I mean? So you hear something in the middle of the night, 
fucking bastard. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as you just ripped a hole in your jacket yeah. or whatever you're wearing, you know. Um, yeah, we're in the jungle as well. The jungle over there was just, you know, I remember you didn't do anything on the night time, you know, but I remember getting up in the morning and, and this is, when you're in the jungle, there's none, yes, in the night time you hear a lot of stuff and there's a lot of the noises and all the monkeys and all that sort of stuff. But in, in the day, I didn't see too much. I was sort of expecting to see monkeys jumping from trees and, you know, big whatever, you know, snakes and all this. Mm -hmm. The way you just have this vision. But as it turned out, I'm sitting there I'm making my breakfast in the morning um, and there was monkeys. As I was sitting there, I remember monkeys coming across the trees. There was like a wee sort of troop of them, maybe three or four of these things. And I remember, it was one of them wee moments of, fuck, I'm in Kenya, I'm in the jungle. It was one of them wee realisation moments, you know. Yeah. So it was, it was things like that there that you just never would have got, you know, the experience of. And you're in a hammock as well. I remember my hammock breaking, you know, as was just, I just get in there, I just get in my sleeping bag. My mozzie net was down and all this sort of stuff. And ping, <laughs> next thing I'm on the deck. What happened there, you know what I mean? So I had to get up and retie and all this sort of stuff and all, you know. So, so yeah, some great experiences. Um, but yeah, um, and then I went, to, I went to Oman. There's not too many stories I can tell you about out there. It was just the desert, you know, it was, it was really interesting. It was very hot. Um, I broke my, my right arm out there. I, I do have medical records in Oman and one of the hospitals out there and stuff like that. How did you break it? Um, I was playing football. We were playing football and I had a wee guy bent down and I sort of went over and sort of knocked him over as I was running and I went over and as I fell, my, my arm hit a rock and, I, and I, broke my, I broke my arm. So I came back. Um, I came back from Oman black as your boot because of sort of that olive skin with one big white arm. <laughs> the big, obviously, the... the do you the get gas. sent home, or do you have to, when your, your arm's broke, or...? No, you're, well, I, so I had to do... So we weren't staying in hotels. You know, we have a camp in the middle of nowhere, um, and it was all big green tents. So my job was just keeping the, the camp tidy. Uh, the lads would have said me to put the... Before they were returning, they'd have said to me, put the water containers into the freezer that we had out there, um, just for the water and stuff like that. So it was just rear guard stuff, so... Yeah. To be fair, it was really sunbathing a lot of the time. Now, I'd done about maybe three or four weeks before I broke my arm, you know what I mean? But I was, I was actually, I was able to play enemy as well. So I was shooting with my left, <laughs> you know, blank rounds, obviously, you know, yeah. for people doing, and then obviously I'm laying there when they're sort of taking over me and all this sort of stuff, you know. Um, but yeah, it was really, it was really interesting, really interesting stuff. The Falklands, I was out there for four months over Christmas. It would have been hostile, but... In, in, in the, the Falklands. Falklands? The Falklands was, you know... Someone who grew up looking at the Royal Marines, I remember the likes of the, the, um, you know, Mount Tumbledown and, and hearing them stories and, you know, I remember, you know, seeing pictures of, say, SAS guys in, in, in uh, like, holes in the ground and all, you know, hearing yeah. all them stories. I do remember that sort of stuff. Um, so when I went out there, I was able to go to, um, part, of, part of the role out there was you have uh, four weeks sort of cycled. One week's on a range, one week you were doing patrolling, you know, one week you were QRF, whatever it was you were doing. But I remember when we my we were actually really lucky, um, that we got from Mount Pleasant Airport, which is where all the sort of the British base, the British Army base was, and you then go from there to uh, we had the patrol over a week. So staying out, you know, looking after ourselves, carrying all our kit all the way to Port Stanley. And a couple so we passed um where Sa see where, see where Simon Weston was, um, where he was blown up on the ship, um, the Sir Galahad, I think it was called. Um, that area, um, I forget the name of the, the, the bay, but there was a wee bay there, and we actually had to walk around that bay and go on to a place called Goat's Ridge, which then brought us up to just towards Mount Tumbledown. And I remember hearing the story of the Scots Guards, and I knew that story before I was out there. So as soon as I seen it, it was like another one of them wee moments of, is that me? I'm actually here, you know, I'm really... Now, the, we were there uh, over the, over the, um, the summer, Right, so down there, obviously, for anybody that doesn't know, you know, in Christmas time, it's their summer. Obviously, that you know, the and, and the water goes the wrong way. <laughs> I remember that in the, in the plug hole, although that's dead off, but it's things that you remember, you know what I mean. But we got up to, um, we went up to the Goat's Ridge and then headed towards Mount Tumbledown. And while we were doing that, there was uh, like a guy from the military who was doing like a tour, you know, of sort of battle sites and war sites and stuff like that. And I remember we sort of stopped off and we, we, we were listening to some of the things that he was talking about and it was like a big hill. So we actually got a, like, a, like a tour and when we got to the top of Mount Tumbledown, there is a Scots Guards memorial and I have, a, I have another cracker picture I, you know, hold dear 
where I'm standing there with my, my Irish guards buried, you know, combats, the kit on me with my weapon, and there's a, a memorial behind me of the Scots guards on Mount Tumbledown, you know. And I remember looking down over, um, and there was a place down there where um, the Argentinian Marines had stayed there, you know, and there was a, like a big field kitchen that was down there, and it was all rusty, and obviously it was, you know, wasn't like you could throw a bacon sandwich on there, like, you know, but it was all there, you know, so it was just things that just brought the whole place to life. You know, we then obviously went down into, into Port Stanley and, and obviously had, you know, got picked up and all down there. So that was, there's things like that that I remember were really, you know, really interesting to me now, you know what I mean? And out there, to go into the drinking and drugging and stuff like that, not that there was any drugs out there, but there was certainly drink, you know, um, and we had our own bar and all that sort of stuff. We actually made it into the paper, the, the Daily Mirror and stuff like that, I believe, um, where there was a big fight. But it was, in my view, it was men releasing tension. You know, when it was around Christmas time and stuff like that, you know, where it was just a big bar. I don't know how many people was in there. I didn't care. I was, you know, steaming drunk. And I, and I don't know how it even started, but I do remember the fight. I remember just two sides of a bar just meeting in the middle and it was just a section F free-for-all, like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It was just, you know, exciting as that was. I remember a dog. I remember one of the... Um, the, the doggy boys actually throwing, you know, letting the dog go and stuff in the bar. Jesus. And the thing was kicked to death, no <laughs> you know? Way. So it's, there was no, no mess about guys, you know, we were, you know, trained soldiers, trained killers, you, whatever way you want to put it. That's who we were. That's who I was at that time, you know? Um, so back from the Falcons, you know, uh, out there, I was, like I say, big, big drinking, you know, came back and, and, and then I went into this sort of, from sort of the Falcons onwards, I remember it just being you know, just drink, you know, it was just, you know, it was negative behaviours and I got myself in a couple of scraps in the towns and uh, and that sort of thing. I uh, got a couple of these silly charges, you know, for uh, common assault and stuff. Um, and uh, do you know what, before I go into the the transition, I, I will talk about this. This is, this is a fair one. I've said this before and I don't mind sharing this, you know, a, a very prestigious part of being part of the, the guard regiments is being part of the Troop of the Colour. Wasn't that long ago there, there was a, a troop into the colour uh, there. And I was part of the troop into the colour. Um, and I remember, you know, the, the, the night before, the, uh, if you're a troop in the colour, you go out and you have a wee toast to the Queen and all this sort of stuff. Um, me being sort of the alky that I, that I am, I then went from, you know, a couple of beers, and me and a couple of friends then went out and we dropped a couple of E's and then, you know, out we went, partying, raving, you know, um, woke up, sort of, didn't wake up, <laughs> all night we're out partying, came back, all our kit all ready, then down to the trip into the colour and I'm running about getting ready, red tunic, bare skin with these eyes, you know, <laughs> shameful behaviour, you know, when I think back, you know, but I remember going out and I remember standing and we're in the what's called the dog's leg, it's like this sort of position like this, <clears throat> um, and the way it works is there's a big mass band I don't know if you've seen it but there's a big mass band there and it sort of goes from one side of the uh, horse guard to the other um, and I remember the, the big beat of the drum and because I was still under the influence I remember it was standing like oh, this geez. <laughs> do you know and, it's, it's, and that's you know that's yeah. sort of my experience you know um, well I'm, you're supposed to be I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in recovery for nothing do you know what I mean I'm going to say this out loud you know and, and it's fair to say that you know um, as shameful as it was, I, I do remember them things. You know, I remember coming back, I was busted after it. I remember being really tired after that. But I, I was so proud as well to be part of that day, be part of the, the trooping of the colour mm -hmm. and, and being part of, you know, that sort of tell me this, prestigious thing, you know. Yeah, tell me this, Darren, obviously that is trooping of the colours. Uh, it's always been a, a prestigious thing. And was any of your the other guys in the platoon not starting to say... You need to pull your shit together. You're starting to get destructive behaviour here. Like, if you're standing, they're all there, and you're standing bopping in the middle of it. Well, or was you there's were, a was, culture in the army anyway? Of well, there was a, there's certainly a culture of drinking. So, like, a, a drink, the drinking culture is very much where, you know, doing things with a hangover, it's, you know, you, you just do it. You just get on with it. You know, you've, you know you've got to be there. There was none of that stuff. A lot of my sort of uh, substance misuse was hidden. And I was in a wee squad of lads they were doing the same thing, yeah. but a lot of people within the battalion had no idea this was going on, and that, and that's that'd be that's a, that's a fair question to say because it wasn't like this was accepted by the battalion. You know, he's out of his head. He's you know that that was not that was you know as, as you'll find out soon enough here. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean that's 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 an experience that I had. You know, and 
I watch, I do watch the troupe every year and, and I get quite nostalgic and stuff like that, but there's still that wee tinge of, really, sh- really shouldn't have done that. You mm-hmm. know, I really shouldn't have done that. Had I knew better, I would have done better. Bottom line. The only thing, as we move forward, that is a part of the problems and that is a part of the destructive behaviour that, that you've come to identify in yourself. That, oh, yes. That even in them big moments, that demon was taking mm-hmm. control of that. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you should have wanted to have all your senses and be there and be ready and, and enjoy it and, and look back with, with pride, but yeah. it's tainted. And anybody that was, will come on to speak to this, anyone with addiction, some of their moments are always robbed because of the demon you're, that is You're addiction. robbed, yeah. You're robbed of, of some of them really important times in your life. You know, you are robbed of them in, in that sense. And there is that tainted thing, you know, um, I mean, when I worked in the prisons, um, there was a whole range of young, you know, guys in there who would have talked of that stuff to me, you know. Um, and I always remember there was this, there was, you know, uh, I'm jumping way ahead of myself here, but I do remember, you know, a lad going like this. I remember him looking at me like this, you know, looking me up, me up and down. He goes, "What the fuck do you know? You know, what do I fucking know? We didn't hear this." And it was one of the first mm-hmm. times that ever come out. He nearly pushed my behave a wee uh, bit, and I was explaining mm-hmm. some of the things that I had experienced, and I'm not, you know, in my belief. I wasn't in these positions because, you know, I'd spilled a wee drop away in a tie. You know, I'd got myself involved in drugs and violence and, and, and all, all the crazy well, behaviours. We, we but touched on some of the, the, the scraps that you got involved in. Was there ever leeway with the cops a wee bit that uh, he's a squatty, it's, it's a given, we we'll look, listen? Okay. Um, or did they ever contact your your sergeant major or whoever's in charge of, did they ever contact them and say, well, he's out acting bollocks? There was, there was never, I mean, I don't ever remember any sort of relationship with a police officer with the battalion. I'm sure there was. I don't remember anything like that. Um, I will say this. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, there's a wee thing that happened, and this this was one of my earliest experiences of, you know, that, that I think back on now and go, you know, this is, I should have knew better. And I should have been doing better, but I didn't. So it was out one night. It was probably around, um, you know, it was sort of a weekend or whatever it was. We were out for a drink. It was a whole load of us out. I can't remember. It must have been a celebration or something. I can't remember now. But we were down a place called the King's Road. Um, and, you know, I had blacked out, completely blacked out. Um, and no no memory of this. I had to be told some of this. Um, so I had blacked out. I woke up in a, in a, in a police cell. I had no T-shirt on. I had, was wearing a blue, like, denim shirt. Um, and I woke up in a police cell on a... On a I pitched the bed and all this sort of stuff, you know. Um, and I woke up and I was covered in blood. Covered, in, and I mean covered, like from top, um, someone who was violent when they got drunk. You know, I looked at, you know, oh my God, get me out of this one. Like, get me out of this one here. This is, this is bad. You know, I really genuinely thought that I had murdered somebody. I thought I had done somebody real damage. I just didn't know, couldn't remember. So I remember going up and banging the cell door um, and... You know, really giving it some some welly like and, and the cop he just opened the, the wee sliding and he looked in and he just went You're fucked <laughs> And like I see when I think see my stomach even now when I say that, you know, and I and, and he left me in there for ages, you know, and I was running about in these blue jeans, desert boots, covered in blood, crusty blood, you know, um and I was just marching up like marching up and down the cell going, Oh my god, get me out of this one. Nay, 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 God as I've heard it called you know, so when he opened the door and let, and let me out, he had told me that he had arrested me for my own protection, right? So he didn't go into too much detail, but what he said was, and what there was a guy arrested for this. Um, so what he had done was a guy came over and he he, he hit me on the head here with uh, like a Budweiser bottle, and it had smashed on my head. The broken bottle he had stuck it into my friend's face. When he went down, um, I had taken off my shirt and went down to him to try and stem the blood, but it was spurting out, and it was all over. That's where the blood had came from, all this crusty blood. Um, he says, obviously, then, that I was, you know, I was arrested at that time, you know, but probably because I had no idea what was going on, you know. And when I woke up in the cell, that's what him, they let me out without a, a, a single charge, but he made sure that I got the message that morning. He really made sure I got the message, and it's it's one of them wee moments that I, I remember walking down the King's Road, and anybody's been to London... Kings Road, Sloan Square, down to Chelsea is a very prestigious area. It's a very, you know, affluent area. I remember a wee old lady coming over to me and looking at me and going, you know, are you all right, son? You know, that sort of accent. You know, I can't do a London accent, but she was like, 
Are you okay? Sounds more Scottish, but I like it. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, but that's 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 a, a a real life experience of mine in terms of the addiction side of things. You know, we've we and it was things like that that sort of built up. You know, it was experiences like that that sort of built up over time for me. Everybody's you know everybody's different. You know, for me. But were these becoming more common? Like oh, I was involved in see, this was, situation. I mean, I mean, I, I talk about some of this stuff. You know, this for the. Two, the close to three years that I was in the battalion, uh, in the Irish Guards, this was going on on a regular basis, sort of more so the tail end, you know. So I suppose it'd be fair to say that there, there came a point where I remember I was I was just, I, I mean, I went out one night with four friends. I was, um, we were, it was like a rampage through a town, you know, that whole Section F mentality just seemed to, appealed to me when I get in the drunk. I thought it was King Kong and all that sort of stuff, you know. Um, and we went out and we emptied. Uh, we got into a fight and we emptied a few people. I was then subsequently done with uh, the, the charge violent disorder. I was looking at five years in prison for this, for the damage we'd done and the, because it was three what, or more people. Just, came what about. is violent disorder? When three or more people come together right. uh, and cause, obviously, violence. So is it GBH, ABH? What? It's, it's one above. So it's... Right. It sort of goes AOA, BH, right. GBH, GBH with intent, you yeah. know, violent disorder. Or it's maybe on the same part of GBH with intent. Do you know what I mean? So you have hurt people? Oh, we, we hurt people, yes. We seriously hurt. It was, it was, and w all three years received this charge? Or just you? So there was there was three serving British soldiers. And one was a family member who were out that night. And like I say, we went around. Now, for what we got caught for, we didn't get caught for half we done that night. To be fair, you know, and obviously on so that So this point, was just a... Uh, this was a random night, just, you so know, it wasn't, angry, you full got in one fight, you just were going around looking trouble. We were just, we were out to... I, I, was on a, I was on a mission, I was just on... The way I was, I was, you know, I was just fired up, I was just angry. We had been watching sort of videos about the trouble, I can't remember what... But we were just in a frame of mind, somebody was getting seriously done that night, you know. um, You know, too much shame, that's the, that was the main set. And, and, and yes, there was people... But emptied in the, in in that town. We appreciate you being honest in in that. And I think it's fair to be honest. I think it's you know. I mean, if you sugarcoat this, people will see that and and they'll think that. But it it's not a look. Listen, we've come back to this section F thing quite a few times. This mm -hmm. mentality of just out and out violence, hurting people, unleashing hell, seems unleashing to have hell. reared its head quite a few times. But now this seems to have caught up with you. That. Big time. It, it was it was so unacceptable. It was unbelievable. You know, um, I was then brought to a police station. I after that there, I was remanded in custody. So I was remanded in custody. Went to the police station, and because of a couple of previous charges, s silly charges, two common assaults, and, and and you know, serious enough, I suppose. But in comparison to what I had just been done with, you know, I had blood all over my boots and all, and all this sort of stuff. I remember throwing my boot at the pillar and all, and you know. Just, just mental behaviour, crazy, crazy behaviour under the influence. And like I say, when I got drunk, I was, I, I was angry, I was aggressive. I was, you know, it was just that was what came. Out. It wasn't like that when I'm sober. Absolutely, you know, the Jacqueline Hyde, absolute Jacqueline Hyde. So I then um, was then remanded in custody. It must I, have been. And I, I remember. I, I don't want to push you too much in this, but you must have hurt somebody pretty bad because mm -hmm. they've remanded you. Yes, they did. Because yes. you're in the so, army, they would have knew where you were. They would have only remanded you if people got proper hurt. Yes, there was there was four people. There was four people hurt that night. So there was really badly. Um, one of which, in court, there was uh, a photograph, and it is raw. So anybody watching this, it's you know this this has been my experience. This is real. You know, I remember them showing the the pictures, the crown showing the pictures, and one of the fellas had the whole side of his head, whole side of his face, black eye. It was all red in there. That was all down, you know, all down that one side. I remember, that was the only picture I seen. For um, that, and it was only a, it was only a, 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 like a fleeting glance. For that charge, there had been life changing injuries that that they. I, I don't think there was life changing. I think it was the traumatic side of it and the fact that it was, you know, I mean, they said it in the in the court and stuff like that. You know, um, that we were train killers, and that's true. You know, you don't as a soldier, you don't think as yourself as that, but. In the civilian world, fucking right you are. You know, you're a trained killer, you know, being a fighting day, you're being trained to do all this sort of stuff. Was this a way, was this <clears> a way, so when you're in this, did did you, because you're still young and this is all going off and you're still aggressive and angry, 
were you at this point reflective of this or was this like just the anger was still there and you were still going through this or I you know I've given that a lot of thought uh, Owen I really give that a lot of thought I there, there's at no point do I remember me sitting back and going you know I shouldn't be behaving like this this at that time it seemed like it was the most normal thing yes it felt bad yes it felt wrong I should have should have, I have been doing that sort of and them, them behaviours no absolutely not but I, I, nobody ever pulled me to the side. It was like, you're a big boy now. You need to make your own decisions. You know, so I was just taking alcohol and then obviously. But, you know, if you, excuse me, you could look, I mean, if I if I self-reflect on it now, I could turn around and say, you know, was I missing my mum? Was I missing home? Was I missing my family? People who loved me and were talking to me and would have said to me, you know, you shouldn't be doing this sort of behaviour. You know, was I missing that sort of? Yep, probably. Quite, quite. Was it in a group of guys that were, hardcore drinkers that I just fell in, felt that I had to, you know, like a bit of, bit of peer pressure, had to drink the same way as them. I mean, I wasn't, I mean, it, for me, when, when the drink was in, it wasn't so much, you know, the damage that alcohol done to my body. It was my subsequent behaviour. See, whenever I took drink, all this, this guy came out, this, you know, this crazy guy who was violent, angry, was a, you know, what a chaste woman and, you know, People's waves, you know, just at a later stage, paramilitaries' waves. Thought that was some crack. Do you know what I mean? At that time, you know, lethal stuff. You know, really, you know, self sabotage. You know, I mean, was there was there trauma there due to you know my earlier childhood experiences? I did experience you know uh, violence at an early age as well. You know, um, so there was a range of that sort of stuff that is is now coming to the fore. And I was maybe self medicating through alcohol and drugs. You know, it just so happened that I was in the military. <laughs> it seems, you know? though, that violence, even alcohol, and, and you see this for a lot of people, you said you're shy, alcohol allows people that confidence, mm-hmm. and violence went hand in hand. It sort of gave you your identity and your power, and, and the shy person then became this different person. But you were in court. Yep. And then you, you did you plead guilty? or you Plead guilty, yep, 100%. Caught a waker. Um, and probably more so... So uh, I'll, I'll cut through this quickly because this this was probably the worst time in terms of my drinking and my behaviours. Um, and I'm, I won't go into a great lot of detail because if, it was, if I was to share some of the stuff, there's no doubt in my mind I'd be arrested for some of the stuff. I've no doubt in my mind for that. Um, I was remanded in custody. I was two weeks in uh, um, Reading Prison. Um, I was then let out. Um, the military came and, you know, spoke up for me and told me that they would remand me to the barracks, which they did, but tr- strangely enough, was actually in Purbright at that time. Um, and then I, between me doing that, whenever that was, that violent disorder charge and being let out from there until I was sent to prison, um, or back, to, back to Reading, on the, on the 2nd of February, um, I, 1998 that was. Um, I, that them months... I was suicidal. I just I knew I was losing everything. I knew everything was falling apart. I didn't care about anything. It's just I refused to soldier. So all this prestigious stuff, I just refused to do it. I just didn't want to do it. And I was in the guard room. I ended up then and I done a couple of I done about four or five days in the in the guard room and stuff like that. You know, military prison. You know, and that's not nice. And I will I don't mind sharing this because they would have got you up at like three o'clock in the morning. And you had to polish, you know, the the copper pipes and stuff like that, and you know you were just you were just constantly under that pressure. You know, it was it was really, you know, now the mindset that I have, I was like, these fucking bastards aren't breaking me. I'm just gonna take this. I'm just gonna take it. Do you know what I mean? And you know, I had that real sort of, they will not break me. I will, you know, get through this, and I'll, you know, show. but there was times away from the the, the the eyes and stuff like that where it was. Just lost a military career. I've just, you know, this is going out the windy. You know, I remember the pain, you the know pain of that. Guilty. Yeah, I remember drinking a couple of ba- bottles of Mad Dog Twenty Twenty, and I was going to throw myself into a river. You know, I remember. You know, that's the savage state of mind. That's where alcohol took me. You know, and, and that's that's sort of er, that's early on in comparison. You know, to some of the places that it took me, and and at that time there was nobody really being affected as I thought. I remember the pleading the guilty. Uh, we all pleaded guilty. Um, and I remember us going to the, the court. I remember there was a couple of things specifically that I remember. Um, 
I remember handing like you get an army ID card when you go over when you go into the military. So I remember handing that over to one of the uh, officers who had turned up for us. Um, told him to shove it up his arse. To be fair, um, you know, anger didn't know how to handle that at that time either. I didn't know how to deal with them emotions. Um, I then went in. I remember the judge. He looked like a judge. You know, the wig and the red and all that sort of stuff. I remember them talking about you know the, our guy. Um, our barrister was talking about the fact that we were from Northern Ireland. This is over in England. He said these guys have lost, you know, a, a military career in this. He also then said uh, things like, you know, the the other family member was only 17. I was 18. Um, the other guys were a couple of years older than me. Um, and he said this young lad, and he spoke about him and this sort of thing. He, he then said that they will have no family visiting them because they're from Northern Ireland and all this. So it was things like that there that he said. The Crown, who was obviously against us, or the PPS, I think it is, you know, over here, they were, uh, they were, these guys are trained killers. These guys went out, they didn't have any remorse, haven't, you know, any, any of this sort of stuff. Um, the fact that we pleaded guilty also got us time off. So the maximum charge that I was aware of for violent disorder was five, five years. years, five years. In my mind, I was, I was going, I'll probably get about 24 months. That's, that's what I was expecting, to be fair. And, and I have to be fair about that. Three years, maybe three years. That's, that's where I was sort of going with it. Um, and just in my head. Nobody told me that either. It was just, that was my, you know, perception of it. I then, um, when the judge sentenced us, sentenced us um, just before he, there was a break, you know, where they go out and deliberate and talk and whatever it is they're doing. Um, and then what happened was, the, I, I refer to them as officers now because I've worked in the prisons and, and they do an amazing job. But at that time, there were screws. You know, these screws come out, there were four or five of them. Um, and they were just surrounding us, you know, because there was four of us in the dock. Um, and he then said, right, you know, three of us got 12 months, um, six months, six, a six and six, basically. So six months in, six months on probation. And the young lad got six months and he was to do three and three out. Um, we then went down the stairs and see, to be fair, I remember I was like, fucking yes, happy days. Because it was like a relief that we only got the time that we got. I also remember it being... I had had him, the army had tortured me. They, they they had, I can't even go in. They had me basted up and down, and there was a whole range of stuff, you know, that uh, they had me doing. They were you know, banging me up all the time. They were locking me up all the time. It was just in. I had a couple of kickings from the lads and stuff like that, and all because I had this, you know, this the regiment and all. Do you know all this sort of? Stuff? It was just yeah. mad negative. So I was glad nearly to get away. Well, I would do, sorry, go ahead. It's, it's, I just want to ask you that because your regiment, they would not have took kindly till you catching that charge. No, it's the dis. The, and we we spoke to others. It's the dishonor, and and they don't mind the rowdiness of a bit of boxing, but this level, and the, the, I'm surely then they cut some media or you know like local media. I, I, I am aware. I am aware. While the sort of case was going on, there, I I'm not going to say the town or where it was or any of that, but I do remember a local paper. Um, had covered the story. I do remember that. And I, I have subsequently, as part of my recovery process and, and, and amends and stuff like that, I've uh, attempted to contact that paper. I've attempted to even, you know, make amends to the people that were empty that night. Um, you know, that's that's just part of the, that was part of the deal. But yes, it was a, we were dishonourably discharged. Three of us were dishonourably discharged from the military that day. So that, for that, that happens. You're suicidal. Is it fair to say going to prison saved you in a way? It might have saved somebody else from the violence to stop and, and saved you for a bit because it would be fair to say to that break the cycle. Yes, it that. was. It really broke the cycle. Um, you know, when I I remember when I went into the prison, um, when I went to Reading, um, they put me so two of the guys went to uh, like adult prisons if you want. I went to a young offender center, um, and the other lad he went to a place called Feltham, um, in just I think it's southern London, is it? Um, so I went to I went to Reading, and when I went in there, it was if you imagine what a prison's like, that's exactly what it's like. You know, it has that the, the layers, it has that big sort of grill. You know, and I remember some of the the officers, the screws coming over to me and going, "Oh, you used to be in a guard's doll." You know, they were like, you know, and I asked a couple of days in after I sort of got myself the gear and found about the orientation and all this sort of stuff and all, you know, and um, but there was that conversation, and I think they were just trying to get to know me and where I was at and all this sort of stuff because. You know, when people first come in, you've got that assessment when you're looking at somebody and, you know, where are they? And, you know, things that maybe they're ashamed of their crime and, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. You just imagine what was going on, you know. 
Um, I ended up, I was banged up with a, an Irish traveller <laughs> and he was a gig. <laughs> and you know what? I think, looking back now, somebody put him in my cell in a sense of the fact that he was, his attitude towards things was just hilarious. You know, he had, um, you know, should I share this, should I not? Yeah, well, you know, it's. I think this is a fair one. You know, he had smuggled in, uh, in some way, you know, some, some brown cannabis, you know, and he made this pipe for me probably three, four days in after all this, all this, you know, and I think I slept the, the first three or four days, you know what I mean? Um, and he made a, he made this, this, this bong out of the, the material that he had. And, and, and I remember watching with fascination how he constructed this, you know what I mean? Now, he was doing it for himself, you know, and he said, do you want to be a bit? He, he, hearing it was an ex, he didn't think I was actually, I was like, oh, I give us a, so I remember taking a wee blow of this stuff. Fuck me, I just... Just I knew all the maybe it was just all the emotion or whatever, and I just on the bed. I remember they used to come around in the nighttime with a big urn of hot water, um, and you would have got you know a cup of tea or you got your flask filled or whatever. I didn't have a flask that time, but I got a cup of tea. And I remember like I was on the bottom bunk as such, and I rolled out of bed, <laughs> rolled out of bed, and obviously over to the thing to get a, to get a cup of tea, and then obviously up onto the onto the thing and stuff, you know. Um, but not not it's you know I laugh at stuff like that now and what a combo. Oh my god! A, 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 an ex-soldier from Shankill and an Irish traveller stuck in an English prison. It's like the start of a bad, uh, a bad uh, gay Richie movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what, I'd love to meet that guy now. You know, he was he was toughy not too as well. I remember him being tough. You know, um, but I then obviously I didn't get moved, so I only went there for I was there maybe two or three weeks or whatever, and then I went up to uh, a place called Only, um, which is in Coventry, a young offender centre. So. Uh, in there, I, I, there's a couple of, I can tell you a couple of stories about this, you know, um, one of which I've shared with young young guys that I've worked with in the in the youth state of things, because I think it's fair to say this, you know, I had this perception that I was this real tough, train killer, you know, ex-football hooligan maniac, you know, tough guy, I thought I was tough, you know, that's not, that's not the tough that, that I believe, you know, but at that time I thought it was. I, when you arrived in only, they gave me, um, they give you a wee, a wee welcome pack. At that time, I was a smoker, um, and he gave me a, a packet of skins with HMP on, uh, only and stuff like that. I remember keeping some. Of, I think I've still got some of them actually in the house, in some far away, you know, <laughs> uh, box somewhere, you know. Um, but I remember when I went in, they offered you a shower because I think it was like three hours of journey up to from say London to only in Coventry, whatever, whatever that distance is. So we got offered a shower, I went in for a shower. And when I went in for a shower, you know, I don't know about yourself, but you have this perception that people are, you know, within uh, within prison, they're going to rape you, they're going to do this. You have all these, you know, this is all going on in your head. For anybody who says they're not thinking like that, they're, they're full of shit, right? And so I went into the shower and uh, this wee lad, this wee young, wee, wee, wee black fella, um, well, well put together. He was smaller than me, but he was, you know, really muscly, really well put together. And he said to me, he says, oh, you're in my cell. He says, uh, you know, I when you get up to the cell, I'll give you the rules and whatever else. And in my head, I was going, aye, fucking little do you know, kid. You've an everything coming, like, you know. So mm -hmm. sorted myself out, walked out of my cell. The, the, the screw brought me up. I had a, a black bag with all my stuff in it. Um, and I had a radio, a big, long sort of antenna on it. And, I, and, I, and in my head, I was going, if he thinks he's raping me, if he thinks he's, I'm going to be his bitch in this room, He's another thing coming. I tell you that now, right? And I was, <laughs> I was fired up, like, you know, being a fighting day in there, like, you know, as here we go, you know. Um, so I went in, and it was all fear. It was all fear. I was afraid of what this kid was going to do to me, you know. So I went in. As soon as the cell door closed, I just went bang, just banged him over the head with this radio. Radio went into smithereens, bang. He got up into his into his bed. He never moved the rest of the night, and I done what I done. Got into bed and whatever, um, and. And only you had to go down and get your breakfast. You, you know, it's not like they brought it around, you know, breakfast and bed or anything. You go down and get it uh, and then bring it back to the cell in these like big silver trays. Um, and I'm sitting there and it wasn't a word said. And, and then he, he looked at me and he says, you know, he says, uh, why did you do that last night? Why did you hit me with that radio? I says, because you told me you were, you know, going to give you the rules when you come up. No, he says, I was only winding you up and, and this sort of thing. And I was like, oh, fucking dead on, mate. You know, in my head, I was going, this guy here, you know, if I'd have, if I'd have been a lesser guy in my head, Tune in Tokyo. this guy would have been like, I've been, you know, polishing his fucking bell end for a while. 
Excuse the language. Excuse the language. But, that's, but, you know what but you know what I mean. You know, you know, that's the, you know. You were going to be that expensive. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's exactly the way I had sort of seen it. But I was preventing that from happening, you know. And, and he could have said to me, Rick, you're cleaning the toilet, you're doing that there. As it turned out, he said to me, but in my head, I was like, if I'd have said, aye. But yeah, he's saying that to you. He was saying that, that to me. That could have went narrow. That could have went, that could have went, listen, you're doing this, you're doing, and like I say, it could have went a very different road. I wasn't going to let that happen. But, you know, on reflection of that, I know today that that was going to be, you know, that was fear. I was afraid to go in there as to what he could have done and, and all that sort of stuff, you know, all them, you know, perceptions and, and that sort of thing, you know. But and your poor radio was fucked. Raging. raging. <laughs> and, like, I've worked in prisons now and, you know, there's, there's people, uh, there's, you do get, you know, TVs and stuff in there and I, there was no TVs in my cell when I was. I did I did have a go at making hooch. I will say that. I had a go at making hooch. I had a making drink. Didn't do very well. Somebody had told me how to do it. I ended up, you know, got a sugar high from it, I think. You know, um, at a later stage as well, I had a family member come over um, and brought me a wee bit of, wee bit of brown dope. Um, and, I, and I don't mind saying this either because these are real experiences. These are things that sort of happened, you know. Um, and I remember, uh, you know, when they give it to me, I just put it in my mouth and swallowed it right away. But the the um, the interview or the the visit was two hours long, so I had taken this straight away, and I had ingested this by the time I got back to my cell. In my head, I should was fingers down the throat, trying to get the, the you know this is you know, and like I say, I'm laughing at this stuff, but this this is you know I think back to this is madness, you know. Um, so it went through my system, and I had to get, you know, this out of my system the other way. Let's just say. Um, at that time, I had an orderly job, and I was I got a bread bag, you know, done the business, got this out, and you know, <laughs> I, I had to go smoke. through. I had to go oh, through. That's a tasty I, smoke. You know? That was the same brown you were smoking that traveling. <laughs> 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 hey. there, was no, there was no nuts in it. Or anything, you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the bottom line is this here: it was it was a shitty lesson that I learned. You know what I mean? You know. Excuse but the you say, you know, I did get it, I did get it, and I ended up then, you know, having a wee smoke and all, whatever, and, you know, it was all... I hope you enjoyed that smoke. Oh, so man, that's not how it worked for that one, you know, like, I was saying, I worked for that one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there was no hand hon- sanitizer in the cell or anything, you know. So, I'll ask you this, Darren, then you obviously had your smuggling techniques, and uh, you're in, your six months was up, what, what happened then? Or was that? Well, was, or, uh, did you have any more altercations in prison? Or uh, no, not really. Um, there was a couple of arguments and stuff, and um, I didn't have. There was nothing really that I could turn around and say. You know, there was nothing really there that, you know, yeah. was as as crazy as that over the head with a with a with a radio and stuff like that. There was a couple of rows and a couple of disagreements and stuff like that. There was a couple of people would have referred to me as you know the IRA bad man. He would have got all this sort of you know. I, I, I got on better with the black men um, in, in prison, <laughs> particularly in the shower room, you know what I mean? I'm only choking, I'm only choking. <laughs> <laughs> you were polishing a few things right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that negatively towards black men, obviously, you know, I, I need to feel, say, feel the need to say that, you know, I'm only having a wee bit of a laugh there. Um, but I, I got on better with them, probably because the, the whole prison seen me as Irish. You know, somebody who's Meshangal who didn't consider themselves Irish, you know, was very anti seeing themselves as Irish mm-hmm. at that time, you know, um, I would have then, you know, had, you know, words listening to that. And you get fed up telling people as well, all this sort of stuff, you know. But, you know, there were some good lads in there that I met and I, I got into the gym in there and stuff like that. Um, I also was told, because my crime was committed under the influence of alcohol and I was uh, sort of drunk when I'd done it, I had to go to meetings um, of a 12-step recovery group, um, which which I did. Now, the truth be told, I had a went and done ballerina if I told me to get out of my cell because... I didn't like that confinement. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie about that. I didn't like that. You know, you were always constrained. You were always to where you were going. Didn't like all that. So I like to be free and go and do what I do. You know, I still love the outdoors today and all because of all that. You know, um, <clears throat> but I was going somewhere with that. Um, yes, so I ended up then in, in a meeting of a uh, 12-step recovery group. Um, I remember a guy in there actually saying that he he used to drink to get drunk. And I that was my first identification within a 12-step recovery group because I didn't see any other way of drinking alcohol. To this day, I still don't see any other way of drinking alcohol. Why would you drink, have a couple of beers and go home? I never got that. That never, I never done that, ever. As far back as I can remember, I never, that never happened to me. You know, um, so, yes, I got out. I got out. When I arrived back, so, there's a wee bit of a story. I, I They give you brew money and stuff like that and, and, and weirdly, I, I, I went into prison about maybe 
nine and a half stone. Um, I they weigh you when you get out. You've got a whole, there's a whole process you, you get weighed and all that sort of stuff. And I was I was ten and a half. I was ten and a half. So I put a stone on in prison, given the fact that what I was taking and the way I was living. You know that's completely understandable. You know. Um, I remember as well them giving me money and I had to go down to a train station um, because I was going from only in Coventry up to Scotland to get the boat across to Northern Ireland um, that way. So I got on. So they give me, so I was in prison clothes while I was in uh, only. So when they give me my own clothes, they give me the clothes. Uh, this is my, I don't know why they've done this, right? But they give me the clothes that I was wearing the night that I had committed my offence. So I was wearing a black shirt and like uh, sort of a darker pair sort of jeans and the boots that they give me had they had this white square around the blood spots. You know, like the evidence, mm -hmm, the forensics. Mm -hmm. So that's what I that's what I went home in. I thought that was, I, I, I just couldn't get my head around that. That was such a strange thing to happen. But it's things like that that you remember, you know. Um, down to the train station, I bought two bottles of Bud as soon as they arrived, which I should not have done. I got on the train, I met a fellow on the train who was, I smelt the weed, I got a wee bit of weed. So we ended up drunk, ended up stoned. By the time I got to Stranraer, across the boat in Larn, I was blittered and fell down the, you know, fell down the stairs to my mum and dad and welcome back. I, out, I sort of went out that night, I don't remember too much about it with my family. Um, I woke up the next day and there was 22 people dead in the Oma bomb. And I, and I never forget that. You know, I woke up when the news was on. So I arrived back in Northern Ireland the day of the Oma bomb, which was what, the 16th of August? You know, so that's that's what I rem I remember that as well because it was like a welcome back, you know. But having been through all this ordeal, you know, I had lost had a bit of a silver tongue when I got the drink in me, and you know, I chat up on a bird. You know, I thought it was King Dingling, and you know, when I came back, I came back with this. I had left England, come back to a community that has rules that are enforced by people within the community, you know, which didn't suit me. You know, um, I remember I'd lost all my confidence. I just. You know, when you have a job and a six pack and you think you're keen to a thing, you know, and you have a couple of quid in your pocket, I come back and I ended up on the brew. That, that I didn't know that until maybe, you know, recently, that that was actually, a, that's a trauma. That sort of pulled out of something and then going through that whole turmoil and then coming back to Northern Ireland, you know, with no prospects because I didn't do well in school. Absolutely none. So I suppose at this time, uh, it would be fair to say that I... You know, living in the community, I came across, um, there was a couple of times that I came into contact with people who I shouldn't have come into contact with. Um, I went into uh, what's what's called the Shabin but this night, and I got slobbered into this fella and a few drinks, thought it was, um, and then he said to me, right, let's go, fair dig outside. And I've said this to youth groups and stuff, you know, how do you how do you turn down a, a fair dig? Do you know what I mean? How do you do that? Even in schools, how do you do that? You know, it's really difficult for men specifically to do that. I was like, right, and this guy was a connected guy, so to speak. So I was like, right, let's go. So we went outside, um, had a fur dig. Um, nobody joined on, or I'm going to say a fur dig was a proper fur dig. Um, and the way it worked out was, I, I believe I got the better of him, you know, and he took that bad. He took that really bad. A um, couple of days later, somebody contacted me. I'd been down to a club <laughs> for a particular time um, on a particular night. And I remember getting in, and I didn't take any drink, nothing. I remember getting in. Um, I knew exactly what was what was going to be what was going to happen. Um, I didn't know to the severity the severity of it. So I went in and I sat down, um, and I remember sitting in a bar and sort of looking around me, and then I reckon recognised a couple of faces and that sort of thing. And the guy who had phoned me or contacted me came to the door, and he went like that, just came like that there. Nobody in the bar even batted an eyelid. I was sitting there with a, a, a Coke, Coca-Cola, um, and I went with him. Um, he never said a word to me. We went up the stairs into like a nightclub-y type part of the of the club. We went into the toilets. Um, the door closed, um, and there were two guys standing there. And, you know, everybody has this perception that it's, they're standing there on woolly faces, and they're sitting there with this, you know, they've got a badge on that says, you know, I'm such and such or whatever. Nothing like that. They were standing there in two football taps, you know what I mean, pair of jeans. And the guy who called me up the stairs looked at me like that. He just he looked me in the eye and he said, you never, ever touch one of our men again. He then says about, he says, about the business. He says, that's our business. And I had drawn attention to that by fighting outside of it, you know. So long story short, the minute he finished talking to me, the two guys just put me in the deck and kicked the fuck right out of me. I, And I remember, you know, I was like this. I was trying to protect, I'm 
cover my face and there's a mic in front of me, you know. But I remember trying to protect my teeth and thought it was good looking and all, so I didn't want any scars or any of this sort of stuff on my face, you know. Um, and it was now it was over pretty quickly, but it was a sincere message to me, you know. And that, and that's a that's a real experience, you know. I know maybe we've got American or people outside of here, you know, maybe go, but that's that's legit, you know. Um, so yeah. You um, got, you got a paramilitary beating. I got a punishment beating, yeah. Shit. And I, I got two of them. I've actually had two of them. There's no such thing as a far digs when you're going to end up getting kicked to shit. Do you know? Do you know the bad thing about it was right? <laughs> the thing about it was is you sort of hear stories, right? Growing up where I grew up, at you know at one at one time it was commonplace on, on both sides of the community, not just mine, you know. So you, you accept this for what it is, you know. Today I sort of. Have issue with that, like I'm violent, anti, I'm even anti violence today. I have to say, um, but I will say this here. You know, I remember I've heard stories of people going down, and they were going down to get shot, or they were going down to get beat up, or, or or stuff like that. There, and they were going down blocked. You know, get a couple of drinks in them and this sort of thing. And you know? in my head, I was like, I'm I'm not going down. I'm going to take this sober. I'm going to take this because if I have to get up and run, or I, I need, I wanted my wits about me. I remember that. You know that thinking. You know, you know, everybody's different. You know, um, but I do remember that. I remember that as well, you know. Um, and I got a couple of bruises and a wee scar, a tiny wee scar on my face here where one of where the first punch hit me. Um, or maybe it's that eye, I don't know. Um, but it is there. I'm going to zoom in on that. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> I, I remember listening to somebody got a punishment beaten before and they're like, I was glad to get the beaten because I thought I was going to get kneecapped. Because depending on the severity of it, they're like, and they were being handed out then too. So... Yeah, they were talking about it, and they're like, "I'm glad I got the beating." Yep. Some of them are. You're really glad. You're really glad. You know, I know. I know people have said that. You know, you're really glad to get it because it's the end over and done with. That's it. Job done. See if you can through all this. You know, court and all this sort of stuff. You know, so there's an awful lot of did that. Going. Did that make you watch what you want then after that, or? Did, did uh, well, it's all right me saying that. You know, in the sense of when I got drunk, I my subsequent behaviour changed. So it didn't really. I was like. I'm just going to go out and do what I do anyway. Did, I, at no point at this time did I think of, right, I need to give the drink up. I need to stop the messing about. You know, I was going down. I was living in the community. I was living in, you know, these particular clubs and stuff like that there where you were going. The people that you had beat me up had seen them, you know, up to even, it wasn't even that long ago I seen one of them. Do you know what I mean? I don't say I load him. I will say that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But being, um, being not aggressive, drinker, violent type person in in when you were in the drink, how did you cope seeing these people again? Do you want to, you know, wait till they're coming out of a club one night and, you know, empty them? Like, but I suppose you just, when you get a sincere, you when numbers. you get a sincere message, yeah. you sort of know, you know, why, why would I make things worse for myself? Mm -hmm. You know, these are not people you can negotiate with. You know, at that time, it's, it's obviously there's different processes now and all. That's when I was, you know, what age was I then? 20, 21. But anyway, you know, through a range of, you know, um, through a range of stuff going on, I ended up, uh, I ended up then being put out of Belfast because of my behaviour. I went down to uh, Bangor, lived in a place called Dufferin Avenue for a while, um, and I then. I just want to pull you back there because that, that how, how do you get the message that it's time to leave, or were you putting your hand in, in the honey nest that shouldn't <laughs> shouldn't have been in? And normally that comes from two things: you were interfering with the business. Or you're interfering with the missus? So, you know, it's... <sighs> take a deep breath. Right? <laughs> Settle myself down a wee bit. So, I had been... My behaviour, while under the influence, I wasn't really listening to what they were saying, you know. And there was different things that I was doing, which will not be podcasted, you know, to make a couple of quid. It got me into a bit of trouble, you know, with these people, you know. And I didn't care who they were. Didn't matter, you know. In my head, I was like, you know, fuck them, you know, that sort of attitude. But you want to stay away from them as much as possible. But it's like, you know, you imagine the mafia, you know, like the mafia in a sense, like if they, they go on what people are telling them. There's no, like you need, within the courts and all, you need factual evidence and all that sort of stuff. None of that's going on. You know, once you know that this is, that you're doing these things, these people, you know, they just come and say, you know. And I actually think it came through, I actually think my mum was involved in this in the sense of she was told. Do you know what I mean? It came through, there was a couple of different avenues that it came. Um, I, once I got this sort of message, I was like, it was more of a fear for me. I was like, do you know what? These guys are going to fucking shoot me. These guys are going to stiff me. Like, you know, I'm going to end up in a wheelie bin here. You know, 
So it was did more you, of a... Did you think if you didn't leave, they would kill you? I, I have no doubt in my mind. No doubt in my mind. You know that. Well, now, <clears throat> is there a process to that? Will it be shot first? Will I then... I don't know. You know, it just takes somebody with a... You know, a couple of beers in them and go, do you know what, I've had enough of this wee wanker. You know, you just you just don't know, you know, and, you know... And that was the culture. That's the culture. Men were getting was, shot that's, and that's, men were getting laid out. So. That's growing up. That was growing up for me, you know, and, 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 and you know, the, the, the way I see it now is I sort of giggle and laugh at this, you know, I left this country, went away over to England where there's none of that, and then come back with that sort of culture in me, back to Northern Ireland. I mean, I remember going to clubs and people you know, turning around and looking at you. As soon as you walked in, I used to love wearing, I, used to, I was a bit of a, a raver and a dancer. I used to love dancing. I used to wear these like, you know, urban black and white combat trousers. When you walked into a club <laughs> where I'm from and wearing these trousers, people are what's, they're coming in here to read out a message or something, you know yeah. what I mean? So it was just, you know, I just didn't fit, you know, put it like that. That's probably the only way I can say it, you know. So self-preservation, couple of messages through family, you know, um, I then left to go down to Bangor, you know. Without getting into a great lot of detail, um, and I'm not going to go into a great lot of detail, um, I then, I met a girl down there who I had an affair with, um, quite an affluent lady, and we then, there was, yeah, so, we we were told to leave, you know, because I had done, went along with this girl, you know, <laughs> I, need to, I need to be careful what I'm saying here too, yeah, you know no, what I mean, no, you know, it's, Northern Ireland is still a very small place, yeah. And there's cameras on me, so people's going to see my face, you know what I mean? So I need to be very careful what I'm saying. Um, and that's a fair one, you know. The long and the short of it is, um, that girl, in my and this is all my perception, okay? This is what I believe to be true today, okay? That girl was looking out of that marriage. She was looking to leave and go away. I also had issue with drink drugs, messed about, going nowhere. You know, I seen her as my ticket, you know, uh, you know away from wherever. Um, the fact that she was going back to her husband and coming back to them, stay with me at times, really does do my head in. And if the truth be told, I, I I believe had fell for her as well. You know, so I'd said, dear, listen, you know, and, and at that time I was working in the shipyard um, and I had, um, I made a decision. There was a thing at the back of the paper about going over to uh, Tenerife to do timeshare, right? So they give you a month's free accommodation. So I had then relayed this information to her. Um, subsequently, her husband's, Family member, we'll not go into a great lot of detail, I believe was connected in some way. He seen the two of us together and obviously then I got another threat, you know, and this was a, a back-breaking exercise, I believe. It was, that when it came to me, they were going to break my back. That was what I was, uh, that's what I was told. That was what I was informed. So, excuse me, <clears throat> I'd said to her, she had said to me, we ended up then up shipping. I was in a wee flat. She was obviously living with a hum, hus, husband. We then went over to the Lisburn Road. We were over there for a couple of days. Um, I had, I think it was about a week, we were told, you know, get out of the country. Say it was 24, whatever it was, I don't remember now. Um, and we went over to Tenerife to do timeshare for um, for the month. We got a free accommodation. I remember being in the taxi on the way to the airport and not a word came out of my gob. And I remember, because I'm not saying all taxi drivers are involved or whatever else, but you don't know who you're, who's in the, Shit, yeah. do you know what I mean? And it's just self-preservation again, you know. Um, so bottom line is then we went over to Tenerife um, when we arrived over there we uh, got a month's free accommodation um, and it was the start of uh, a, 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 such a such a bizarre but really interesting experience you know I was over there for eight years when, when, uh, what, just was this still an 08 or had we, uh, we moving into 09 here now or? so I let me see well, we arrived. We arrived in uh, Las Los, Los, Los Amarigas on Paddy's Day on St. on St Patrick's Day, the seventeenth in two thousand. So nineteen eighty eight. In that couple of years, that sort of pun a couple yeah. of punishment mm -hmm, beatings, mm -hmm. put out, blah blah blah, all that sort of crazy stuff. Um, and then obviously I met her, and then we went over. So we were we arrived in St Patrick's Day two thousand. Um, there's a place over there called Nakchua. It's not even there now. Um, Nakchua, and me and her went over there. Um, we were over there for you know, um, uh, eight years, although we subsequently broke up. But there's a couple of things I'll, 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 I'll go on a wee bit just about, you know, Tenerife. When I arrived there, I remember, you know, the drinking just suited me. Over here, you know, due to the troubles and whatever, we don't have clubs that are open all night, in a sense, you know, unless they're Shabines or illegal clubs, in a sense. Um, you know, there was coffee shops over there, garages, you know, all open all night, 
you know, you cut one in, got a cigar and a, a, a double vodka and coke any time of the night or day, you know, coming into clubs, you went into coffee shops, you cut a bottle, you drink, you know, all that sort of stuff, you know, and it just, that drinking, you know, really suited me, you know. I also, um, I got a job over there when I left the timeshare. Um, I wasn't very good at the timeshare, I have to say. Um, she was better at it than I was. Um, but I remember there was things that, you know, there was like PR and see people who know me and I'm sure you've maybe got the, the gist of me a bit, you know, I'm quite an open, honest, you know, a bit of a laugh, a big personality is probably the best way to put it, you know, and I know that about myself, you know, I've got to rein that in sometimes too, you know. Um, but I, I get into the pr um, which is standing outside the bars with the tickets, you know, come on in here, we've got the best fry, best steak, you know, all this. And I just, and then I discovered obviously this accent. People wanted to listen to me. People wanted to hear me. Wanted to listen to what I had to say. So I then became really good at it. And then people started headhunting me. And I remember then I was starting to make a few quid doing all this sort of stuff, you know what I mean? It was starting to become really, you know, really, and yeah, it was good, yeah. But I got it myself, I had a driving licence, I was in the army, They got I got my driving licence. And when I was over there, um, I get into, I, I didn't like, again, the confined sort of being in the one place, you know, there was a bar, there was a bar out there in Las Amargas, um, it's not even there now, it's called La Baca, I don't mind telling you, telling you that. So from uh, eight in the morning to one in the afternoon, I was there, you know, selling lunches and breakfasts and all that there. I then had a, like a split shift if you want, so I had, say, from one to, I was five, so I was then jumping on a bus back to where I lived in a place called El Freire, then coming back into La Baca again in Las Americas with a shirt and trousers on, you know, sort of dressed up for the night time. So between five and ten, then I was then, you know, knocking out the, you know, the, the, the leaflets and all that sort of stuff and all, you know. Um, so it was tough going, but I was a young lad, you know what I mean? I, was, I, lo I loved it and I loved talking to people and the characters I met. Honestly, I... I'll share this. I thought I thought this was the strangest thing, right? There was this guy. Um, I'll not say, you know, I'll, I'll admit certain details, right? But this guy came down with a t-shirt on, and he had this badge that I recognise from Northern Ireland, um, an illegal organisation. And I said, I automatically thought that he was from Northern Ireland, right? So I said, what about you, mate? No, how are you? And, you know, you give it the whole Belfast thing. And he goes, what, mate? You know, he's all this sort of cockney, sort of brummy <laughs> or whatever he was. And uh, I says that's an interesting T-shirt you wore. And he says, oh, yeah. I says I was, I was, I was over there for a for a period of time doing a bit of work, and I get into this club and all this. And it was, it just so happened that it was the ones that had filled me in. You know what I mean? So I said, all right, man. I listen. Why all about your business? You're not coming into my bar at all. You know that sort of way. But he was living in, in Birmingham or whatever it was he was living. So he had never, I was, I never even told him any of that yeah. stuff. You know, never let on or whatever. You know. Um, but some of the some of the characters you met over there, and you know. It was just, that stuff was you know, really it was, interesting. It, it's very much a social scene. That couldn't have been playing well to you. Did you have any issue with the Spanish police? Or <sighs> Okay, so we'll jump forward with you a bit then. Yes, um, but not to the level that it did when it was back in the UK as such. I um, I get into the driving. Uh, I was driving fruit and veg, um, starting at 5 o'clock in the morning. I found one of the best hangover cures I ever came across over there called the Catahillo which was like a whiskey and uh, an espresso coffee first thing in the morning. So I was having two or three of these things to get me going because I was, you know, drinking heavily over there. Um, and then that sort of set off my compulsion in a sense. And I was then drinking all day, you know, while drink, so over there I was drink driving for, for years, you know, um, to my shame. None of this again is, you know, I'm, I, I talk about it nostalgically, yeah. but it's again, it's, what was I playing? And this was the, you know, um, so... Uh, you asked me there about the police. So I had, at one point, knocked off the, the mirror off one of the vans. I had parked him behind this guy um, on the other side of the road, bear in mind. So I had to reverse up this hill to get out from behind this car to, to go on about my business. Now, I've been drinking all day, just out of a bar, had a couple of baggers and coke, uh, whatever it was I was drinking. Um, so it was, I was, I wouldn't say I was blocked, but I was, you know, I was well-oiled, you know, Um and I then reversed out. So to go up this hill, I had to put the foot down in the accelerator, you bet, you know, yourselves, you're driving. And I went up this hill, straight into a police car. Bang. Right into the front of the police car. Um, in Spain, in Tenerife, they have three types of police. They have the, the uh, Policia Local, they have the, the Guardia Civil, and they have the Policia Nacional. It was the Policia Nacional that I crashed into. Now, the local, the local and the Seville, the Grande Seville, are like, they would have done me in a heartbeat. But the National were guys that looked after, you know, like say big gambling establishments or gangsters or they smuggling operations. Although they were sort of, you know, the elite of the police over there. 
So I crashed in the race car. And like Rowdy filled in the forms for me for the for the insurance. I I I'm still I'm talking about this. I'm going to use the mic, but I'm talking. Yes, mate. No, yes, the CC senior, CC senior. You know, uh-huh. didn't want to say too much. You know, but he knew right. He, there's no way he couldn't have smelled drink off me. There's just no way. But he filled in the forms and he let me on about my business. And that was talk about squeaky bum yeah, time, like you know what I mean. Oh, ooh, what to think about that now, you know? But he never said a word. So that was the only real time that I got in trouble with the police over there. Um, and it, you know, to be fair, there was not a lot of. In my whole time over there, there was a couple of, you know, I mean, when I'd done time, sure, you were hated. The tourists hated you. And the police locale hated us. So they would have come over and you would have, I would have had a, like a bun, what I call a bun bag or what they're called. Yeah. But in that, I would have had my cards, you know, to hand to people and all this. I, you, you buy these things, you know. Um, and I remember the, the, the locale coming to, I was sitting at the end of the beach, just about to start work. And I just, I threw my bag, you know, down onto the beach because they take the cards off you and you've got to pay for them, you know. And uh, he came over and he unlocked over like this here, you know, over the wall. And he took one lock on me, he hit me like slap the same head. <laughs> so he did. And I was doing initially, I was going to go, what, who the fuck do you think you are? You know, but right, sir, yes, yes, you know, <laughs> reined it in, you know what I mean? Yeah. Reined it in very quickly, like, you know. So it was it was silly things, you know, like that there, that the police. Now, a couple of years down the line, I, um, I did get it myself into a bit of trouble with, uh, a guy, um, he came in one time. He was, he was, he was drunk and he was aggressive, and he talked about him being this sort of mercenary character. And you've all sorts over there, you know, people on the run. You've got, you know, decent guys. You know, it's just you imagine the, the diversity, you know, over there. Um, and this guy, uh, he, he threatened to stab my partner. Um, at that time, you know, um, I don't, I don't think my wee boy was ab- about then. Um, but I, I fucking seen red, and I, you know, you ever see um, the bar that I was working in. I had these two big sort of Bacardi bottles that the likes of Tom Cruise would have done cocktail though. So I had the black hair and all, you know, I started doing all those, throwing these bottles and all, though for the crack and all this sort of stuff and all. Um, and he came in this night and I had these two bottles sitting and he th- and I just I just saw red and I, I smashed the f- fucking big Bacardi bottle right into his face, bang, right across his nose, you know. Um, and I remember, you know what I remember? I remember the nose splitting. There was like a, you know, something happened there. Now, I, found, I, I did find out a number of years later that I had fractured his cheekbone. I did find that out later on, you know. Um, now, he never come back near the bar again and he never threatened to stab anything belonging to me, you know, but crazy, you know, things like that. There. And I went from <laughs> like... A bottle of Bacardi in the face will do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, absolutely. it's been a while since I've actually thought of that, you know, but that's, you know, there, there, I, at that time, was a violent man, you know, and, and, and I... I apologise for that now today, you know, it's, I just, there's people out there with scars in their faces, there's people out there with, you know, a wide range of things that have happened to them due to my substance misuse, you know, I, I do talk about this stuff with a laugh and a joke and a, you know, but at the worst, the serious side of this was, there is going I, to be I was, people. I was no, I was, I was no joke to mess with, like, in, in that sense, you know what I mean, I don't, I don't want to sing that right, egotistical I, either, you know. Because I do want to say this here, there is people that may listen to this, they may have trauma that you've crossed their path and you don't remember, but they have ha- endured trauma from the experience that they've had with you, because, you know, that night out, you won't remember their face. They'll always remember mm-hmm. you. And I'm not saying that to drive it home to you because you're well aware of that. And you, you, you've, you've, you've faced them demons, and you know that that that's that's the thing. But just so people don't think we're glorifying uh, mm. the the violence in this, mm. there, you know, we're all aware now as adults. We're responsible for the actions of everything that we do. Mm-hmm. And that's some. I, I think becoming an adult that's the biggest thing I realized, and I didn't realize that as you say at that age, I didn't realize that. It's only on during your life and with the experiences you have and the reflection you do that you realise we're all responsible for the actions we've taken and done. We're not always proud of it, but I don't want it to seem like we're glorifying that and and we are talking and laughing in there, but there will be people that you path you've crossed with that level of violence that Mm -hmm. may be still the trauma to this day of of that. And you're aware of that. I, I know that. But just so people don't think that we're 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 thing, but it's important we tell it all, yep. So that people can see then where you've come from to what you're doing now. But then you're in Tenerife. Is that Tenerife where you you found sobriety? Is yep. it? So that moving on then. So that's that was going to be my next thing. You know, just in in regards to what you have said. You know, I have subsequently met an awful lot of people in Tenerife who I have hurt, damaged, and I have apologized sincerely. You know, from I got sober, which is over 18 years ago now. I have 
I think I've lifted my hands once, and that was just as a left tannery for it was a guy actually tried to tried to lift my wee boy. Um, I he was only young and I and I, and I lumped him, you know, and I, and I make no apology for that. Oh, I don't know what he was going. I don't like my wee boy had blonde hair. All the Spanish kids were all, you know. So I remember that as well, you know. But yes, um, you I have, had a, I had. Have, a, so sorry, just to. to you, you and your partner had a child then? We had, So we bought a house out there. We oh, bought a house okay, out there yeah. and we, we had a child. She's still out there. He's still out there. Okay. Um, he's now, he's now 20, he'll be 21 here in December coming. Um, so yes, so going into the recovery story in a sense, when we were probably talking, let me see, I got sober. When I say I got sober, I walked into recovery on the 18th of April 2005. Okay, so for the best part of five years out there, this crazy stuff was going on and whatever else, you know, and, what, and, what what took you to the recovery? Was it desperate? Were you no no? So it was um so it was the subsequent behaviour. I I'm, I'll share the the event. I, I've no problem sharing this. I've spoke to my son about this. My ex partner will be aware of this. She was she was there. She remembers it. You know, not everybody knows the full story in the sense of you know how I done what I done and why I went where I went. So I don't mind sharing that. You know, and it's this is legit. This is a legit thing. So. I, like I say, I was a drink driver, all this sort of stuff. I went to pick up a wee boy who was about one and a half. Um, he then was in a wee, I keep going to say the Spanish term, which is the infantile, centro infantile. Um, but over there, it's like a nursery, yeah. like a nursery. Um, so I picked him up. I then went to a drunk drove down with him in the car down to the apartment where we were living and staying at that time. Went in, I had fell asleep on him. I fell asleep drunk, you know. Um, he, at one and a half, then got outside of the apartment. He then walked around the apartment. Excuse me. Um, it took me a long time to come to terms with this as well, you know, in the sense of amends and whatever else. But this is this is a legit thing. Um, he was out walking about the apartment. He um, there was a pool on our complex, and I'm led to believe he was down around the pool as well, at one and a half unsupervised, and and that was my that was my fault. You know, there was no on anybody else. Um, a guy came in. I was wearing a polo shirt. Um, and a guy came in and he, he just grabbed me with a pull shirt and he hit me a big slap, whack. Um, and he says, are you going to get up and look after your son? And I was like, no, I'm not. Couldn't give a fuck about anybody. That's where alcohol took me. You know, that weekend I was, you know, that was just a mad weekend, crazy rows, arguments with her, you know, blah de blah you name it. Um, I was, I was update, you know, and I just, I was, I didn't know it at the time. Um, in, in the initial maybe couple of days, it was a Friday morning, afternoon, whatever it was. I was um, suicidal. I was, uh, I have no problem saying that today. I was suicidal. I didn't know how to take my own life. Um, there was a number of things going around in my head. That's the truth. Um, on the Monday, I had just finished work. I went into a bar. I picked up two vagas um, because one was never enough for me, you know, so I picked up two. I downed the first one, didn't even touch the sides. Um, I left the other one. Which, by the way, to this day is has is is my was my last drink, up until this day. I walked out of the bar and I was going down. There was a wee, like we were right beside the sort of the ocean and the sea. I was going down to the ocean to jump into the sea to try and swim to Grand Canaria, um, and there's no way I there was no way I was going to make it. There was absolutely no way. I know today, there's a ship goes from Santa Cruz to Grand Canaria and it takes three hours, you know, to get over there. You know, a Stanaline type sort of boat. You know, um, I was going down into the sea to jump in and that was the end of it. Now, before I did, I had a phone and I picked up the phone and I phoned a 12-step recovery programme. The person who answered the phone to me was a previous next-door neighbour who was in the fellowship, but I was unaware she was in the fellowship and I recognised her voice right away. Um, she then said to me, listen, there's a meeting on this night. I won't be there. Do you want to, would you go over? And I said, yes. Down get the car. Um, I remember I had sunglasses on. I remember taking my sunglasses off and throwing them away and looking at the sun and I remember thinking one half turn of the wheel and I, I would just go into the front of a bus off a cliff I would not have to admit that I had a big strong me that I had a problem with alcohol I just didn't want to do that that was really difficult for me to do I went over to a place called the Apollo Centre in Los Cristianos um, I walked uh, into the room the room had a sliding door had a wee lip of about that there um, and I, I put my foot in over the door and I asked for the, the lady who had told me the meeting was on, even though she told me that it wasn't going to be, she wasn't going to be there. The guy was there who opened the, the, the he just took one look at me. And I remember his look to this day. I still remember, I have a photo of him in my house, you know. Uh, he just took one look at me and uh, he said, listen, son, come on in and sit down. 
Now, when I sit down, I was so full of fear. I was just, I, I was in the, I've heard it many times in recovery about the savage state of mind. And that's exactly where I was. I was free, I was full of fear. I had snatters all over my t-shirt where I had been blowing my nose. I was crying. You know, I was just in this crazy, crazy mindset, you know. I remember um, the meeting itself being packed to the rafters. You know, I remember there was a, a load of uh, like sort of older men with baldy heads, much like myself today. I remember thinking, <laughs> you know, as funny as it is now, I remember thinking it's like a wee tray of eggs. <laughs> you know, the guy who was talking about, he, he, there was a guy who'd done the chur. So anybody who doesn't understand a 12-step recovery or somebody takes the meeting and or somebody tells their story, um, their experience, strength and hope. Um, I listened to this guy who talked about everything that I had been doing. You know, all the violence, all the drinking, all the drugging, all the philandering, all the pissing the beds. He, he talked about all that to the point where I actually thought, this fucking wanker knows me. He knows. He, somebody's told him about, you know, I was so paranoid. So I remember a guy across the room talking to me going, uh, he, he actually he said in the room, he said, you know, I'm really glad to see him walking in. And I couldn't work that one out. He was really glad to see me. It didn't, it didn't make any sense to me. He, you know, didn't absolutely... Lost, lost on me, you know. Um, the other thing I remember is when I went, when I left the room, um, and I went down the stairs and they went down to a, a bar, weirdly enough, but everybody was drinking coffee and stuff like that. And there was a guy with like blonde, spiky hair, and to me, he he looked, you know, straight, tough does. I thought he was gay. I thought he fancied me. I thought he wanted to get into my boxer shorts because he kept trying to give me his mobile number. And I was going, no, mate, you're all right, I don't want your number. You know, fuck away off. I thought, in the state that I was in, and all, you know what I mean? But I didn't realise that there was people out there who were genuinely trying to help people like me. I didn't I didn't know that that was there. I didn't know that that was anybody who was there in my world who was trying to, you know, who was looking something from me or trying to befriend you. Just, you, you just, arm's length, you know, arm's length. You know, I didn't, I didn't get that level of support and help, you know, just didn't get it. At all, you know. Um, so that was my that was my first meeting after the one in prison, you know, in, in the 12 step recovery group. I from that day obviously, you know, I, I went on, there was a lot of people, you know, talked and told their stories and I remember some of them, you know, sh saying all this stuff about how they changed their life around and, and what they had done and, and the way they had went about it. And I got really close to some friends in there. I got myself a, you know, a spot to call a sponsor in there. Um and I just, you know, it just but I will say this, you know, there was people in them rooms, you know, <laughs> when I went in there, right, I was, you know, I consider, I was like, just, I was psychotic. I was just wired, you know. There were people in there who didn't drink, didn't take drugs. You know, when I came in there, there were people in there who loved me when I was unlovable. And they tolerated me when I was intolerable. I have no doubt in my mind. And I just, you know, I just, when I went in there to be around people who didn't live the way I was living, was was brand new information. Like I was just, I couldn't get my head around it. You know, I just, I struggled with that. You know, I, I thought there was a catch that we're going to jump out on tambourine, start singing, and all this. You know, I had all these, you know, crazy, but none of that was true. The people in there really loved me. You know, um, and thank God for them. Thank God for them. I genuinely today, you know, I've I've met many of them. You know, having gone back over sober and 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 whatever. You know, um, and when I come into the when I come into the fellowship, I stopped drinking. I so it took me a long time as well. Now, when I say long time, I gave up the drink that night. Never had one drink. I was still using weed and still, you know, laying a coke or whatever it is, um, taking a couple of years and this sort of thing. And I went out one night with a couple of friends from work, um, and a guy handed me an iron brew. He uh, told me after I took a couple of drinks of it that there was vodka in it. Knowing that I was off the drink, and he thought this was funny, but the fact that I had, you know, dropped a couple of pills, I had left myself super vulnerable. And from that day to this, I've never talked over. And that was that was nearly two, three years, you know, in recovery and stuff like that. You know, so I never, I never touched. So the drink and the drugs stopped through that. Just and that guy has no idea what he's done for me. Probably, and I've never seen him since. You know, so well, that, what a spidey bastard! Hey, I know. Do you know it's like, it, 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 but bastard. you know, like you fucking do that to a man that's trying to recover. And well, I'm gonna go and 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 say this: in recovery, you can't be taking any any 
Uh, drugs can't. You're not. Well, the, no. The, well, the, I, I personally believe. You know, it, it, it's abstinence. It's abstinence. Yeah. You know, there are other ways. There's people out there that didn't go, haven't, don't go the route that I go, in terms of the twelve step recovery program. That that was initially how I, you know, got off everything, and 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 you know, I would still attend to this day. I'm I'm not you know. I'm ashamed of that today. You know, well, am I happy? I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> am I happy that I found a recovery process? Fuck yes. But darn, you had to go to the deaths. Like your son here died. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. I know. Like fuck it, and and I'm not saying that as you're well aware of that. Like the the fears and as a as a parent, hearing that just just when you were saying that was my my heart was sinking when mm. you were telling me that story, and I was just worried. Only you'd already said. He was turning twenty. I was worrying where that was going. Um, well, it was more. It was more the what. What the thing with that was. It was more my what was happening to me. I didn't seem to care at that time. But when I seen it happening to him, something I professed to love and and cherish and and this sort of thing. When I started seeing that effect in him, that that also fed into you know, and, and it would never have been enough. You know, I've worked with people coming out of prison. Um, and and I, you know, your children are just not enough. When you, if you're in that, you have to make the decision for you. It has to be for you. Everybody around you will benefit, but you have to make the decision for you. You can't just go, oh, I'll do it for the son, or I'll do it because I'm going to save my marriage, or, you know, it's, I'm going to lose my job. It doesn't work that way. As far as I'm concerned, that has been my experience. You know, maybe it, there is people out there like that, but not for no, me. No, no, and I think, you know what? I think that's very brave of you to say, because that was... People will cast judgment, and and my myself, I don't have touch wood. I'm probably too addicted to my phone, but I don't have the addictions like that. So when you're saying that, it's so hard for me. It's so so hard for me to to understand, and it, well, it's hard for people without addiction to always understand addiction, and this is why sometimes it 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 gets lost. You even said it there. It didn't matter your wife or your child or your partner it doesn't matter like that to some people listening to this as a parent or as a partner would be like how could I be and would say it's selfish in, mm. in a way that you're so consumed with the addiction that that logic that side that we're thinking with because we don't have that is 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 eroded it's not there you don't have that like obviously you love your child and obviously you love your partner but the addiction's taken over you that much that it erodes that part of you where it's like that's the most important thing yeah. to me. It yeah. become it it moves up on the priority list. With within recovery, um, there's many people will identify with this who are in a recovery. We we talk about the the obsession of the mind. You know, if you are addicted to a substance, you know, it just it consumes your very being. To this day, my missus and who had never never seen any of this crazy lifestyle that I once lived. Um, has said to me, you know, see when you get, if I see a t-shirt, you know, uh, like say with a, a bear podcast on, oh, I really like that. It'll be in my head until I get it. Oh, you're, it's still there. It's still, yeah. you know. Compulsive people replace compuls compulsive things with other, mm -hmm. if they take up yoga, then they become intensely into yoga yeah. and things like that. But you find that people replacing, it's, it's okay to replace a bad habit with being compulsive about something that's healthy for you or, 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 or thing. And, and I would say now moving in to be in recovery coach and now helping people is your compulsion. It's now... Without a doubt, yeah. Calling. You know, to be fair, you know, when I left Tenerife, you know, I was sober over there for quite some time. Me and her, obviously... Was so that so hard in Tenerife, that environment? No, I, no it wasn't. But I've, you're the millionth person probably to ask me that. And everybody thinks, you know, when you're over in Tenerife, it's a big beer and this and that. But see, when I made that decision, I am... See, even to this day, I'm still anti-booze in a sense. I... If I go out somewhere, you know, um, say a Christmas do or work or whatever it is, I'd not put my, my water down or my Red Bull down and that will not be out of my sight. It just won't be out of my sight. You know, I won't have it in batter. I won't have, you know, in anything. I If I go in for cough medicine, you know, is another one that I'll say, you know, I'm, I just tell them I'm allergic to alcohol. You know, I am to a certain degree. I'm not. I won't come out and... I come out in jails and spots like that, yeah. but I didn't come out in spots and spots, you know. You're definitely allergic to alcohol. Uh, listen, listen, <laughs> I, you, you don't even have to tell me that, mate. You know, one day at a time, I'm recovering. You know, but when I come in, like I say, when I left Tenerife, um, I, I I had to leave because of an injury. You don't get the brew or you don't get, you know, any of that to housing benefit or anything like that. I had an injury in a, a very private area. Um, I couldn't work, you know, I really struggled. I had to leave Tenerife. Um, but I come back, when I came back, I had this ob obsessive desire to do something better with what I was doing and 
you know, I had this thing where I wanted to work with young offenders. I wanted to, you know, I, I just wanted to do something better. You know, for somebody who didn't do any education at all, you know, I didn't do too well in school, didn't do, you know, just education that was so far from my mind. You know, I was too busy chasing wee dolls and drug drink, well, sex and F, you know, all that sort of stuff. I then went on and got my degree when I came back. Now, I had a wee bit of help around all that and stuff, you know, um, um, I volunteered and the, and the stuff. And this this experience of, you know, the fact that I'm, I'm quite comfortable in uncomfortable situations in a, in a sense of, you know, out in the community or whatever, I, I initially began doing detached youth work and I was bringing a wee, you know, PUL group into uh, a place in the Shankill, um, just, uh, just which goes on to the nice the nationalist nice Springfield Road. Um, and I remember the, there was all these German volunteers and all, I remember there, there were all the wee, wee whippersnappers were all throwing these stones and it was pinging off the, the interface and all. Um, and I'm standing there, don't even bother me, you know, and these German volunteers are, what's going on, oh my God, and, you know, and they're on the phones of their parents, saying, but I've seen what happened, and I'm going, like, what are you, what are you getting on like that for, yeah. you know, it just, the, the difference in mindset or difference in that, you know, they're, they're obviously upbringing to mine and, and having experienced that many times, you know, you were, you know, desensitized to it in a sense, but, it became quite a funny story as we went on with them, you know. But I then went on to, I went on to work, um, and I, I don't mind sharing certain things, but I, I never talk about the organisations. I think it's unfair. Yeah. There's so many p people out there doing, you know, so much good work. Yeah. There's so many people out there doing, you know, and where I've worked and where I've been and stuff like that. Um, you know, I've been very lucky. Um, I, I went for a position um, which was working with, you know, young offenders and stuff like that. Yeah, young lads working under under um, who were under threat from paramilitaries and stuff in a restorative justice context, you know, um, and that 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 changed my life. That organisation changed my life. I've no problem saying that. You know, I'm still friends with the team. You know, um, them guys they took on something. I remember, like you know, at a later stage when I was doing my degree, I actually wrote it in my in my in my um, at the beginning your abstract or whatever it was, and your thank when you thank everybody in the in the yeah. you're doing your stuff. I said they took me on when I was a wild card. They had no idea, you know. They, a lot of them didn't really understand a lot of the history of me in that sense and where I had been and all this sort of stuff. They just seen this guy because I was volunteering. I was good at engaging kids. Still am. I'm not gonna lie about that. I, I love that. I love the 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 rougher they are, the better. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I just love all that stuff. You know, like I say, I went and got my degree. Um, I then subsequently left that organization. I went into work as a, an addiction case worker. Um. In McGabry, McGilligan, Haybank, you know, worked with every, you know, uh, inmate under the sun. Absolutely love that. I'm still in touch with some of the team, you know, and, and I love all that, you know. Um, and it's like, the other side of that is, you know, I can't forget about my previous lives, in a sense, you know. Um, I've met my wife today who had no idea, you know, about this this crazy story that I have. Um, and, you know, <laughs> when I used to go to meetings of uh, uh, of the 12-step recovery programs, they I, when I first met her, she would have said, where are you going? Where do you? I used to go to this particular meeting on a Saturday night and I loved it. It was just, you know, the people there, whatever it is. So where are you going? I used to go down and make, you know, tea for these wee old dolls. And because of the way I lived, she really believed that, you know, and to this day, she still, you know, would say, are you going down and make tea for wee old dolls? So she still bothered me about that, hey, you know? just fast forward this part. <laughs> But, you know, that's the change, you know, from someone who was once a young offender to someone who has worked with young offenders in, the, in, 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 a, in a previous life, you know. But that's what gives you the credibility. Like, you, you joked about it there earlier. Some of you come going, what the, who the fuck are you to talk to me? And Love it when they, do they will relate more to you because you know more about them at this point than they know about themselves. You see... Well, it, you know, they can't stroke me just as quick, you know what I mean? I'll catch them out pretty quickly, you know, and I have a... I would like to believe that I have a real way of dealing with, with you know, people who are in them particular situations, you know, um, and like, you know, there's, there's, there's many, there's many stories I could tell you around, you know, where I've been and what I've done and, and, and all this sort of stuff, you know, but moving forward into this stuff, you know, this, my, my mother was my biggest advocate and, and I mean that, you know, she was in the courtroom the day I was sent down, you know, she loved me, you know, and, and, you know, took, she stood up to me and she, you know, she was, you know, the, the person in my family that I seen as my family, you know what I mean? Yeah. That sort of, um, and she passed away a couple of years ago. I was very lucky and I was very, I was able to get up and speak at her funeral and, 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 and talk about her eulogy and stuff like that. And, and I was, you know, I'm a bit of a, I feel like I'm a bit of a leader today. I have that sort of about me and, and I want to have that about me. I want that responsibility nearly in a sense, you know, 
Um, and yeah, so she had said to me about going on and doing, you know, always going to do the best you can. When she seen me coming back, she remembers me, you know, all she more to see me in prison and stuff like that. Um, it was, you know, all that sort of thing. And then coming back, she was there the day I got my mortarboard for my my uh, my degree. You know, on on the on the walls in in London, Derry outside uh, the Millennium Forum. You know, and what a proud day! I've still got a photo of that to this day. You know, I'm very proud of that that yeah. she was there to see that that she's seen the change in the person I once was to the person that I am today, who has went through a a recovery program, who has also you know helped. And, and wants to help many people within that programme, you know. But it was only a, a year or so ago that I started thinking, although I work full time and I have to do this outside of my work, um, I, I always I, I always find that my wife is very understanding. She knows and sees this in me, she sees this passion around helping people and, and you know, you know uh, I, the way she sort of sees it is, you know, that's who you are. It's... I. Don't do this, you know, like nine, say, say, you know, when I finish work at say five o'clock from five to 10, you know, I'm, I'm this, I live this way of life. That's the way she's, she's, it was her that said that to me. It's not me telling you that, you know, um, so this became the thing. I got involved with, um, uh, an organization called the Go For A Program. I just contacted them and, 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 a, and a girl, um, that I spoke to a girl, Louise, um, she was phenomenal. Um, I just explained to her about you know I give her the sort of the, the, the skinny on the on the on my story and where I am where I was you know what I want to do um and she said to me listen you know what do you think about this and it's it's sort of although I had this idea of of a of a of a, a business I didn't know anything about business now working with people and groups and and stuff like that is my it's, it's very second nature to me today I have to say I, I, and I love it the rougher the better, and I've been in some so many places, you know, recently as well. Um, outside of my working hours, I have to say that, you know, in case my boss is watching you because I don't do it during the working hours, you know. You know that day, um, I'm about to get that there, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But the and I will take a day off. I take a day off. I took a day off there to go to um, up to McGilligan, McGilligan Prison, um, and there was a like a health fair up there, um, and my former team had asked me to come in, um, because. There was so although a lot of them didn't know my story, there was a part of the so let me see, April, when I was eighteen years off the drink, I decided to run this event in the Shankill Road in the Spectrum Centre. Um my my one of my uh, good friends, a guy called Brian, Brian Armstrong, who is um he was doing this thing for charity where he had done fifty half Ironman triathlons and equates, you know, mental health and sport as something that, you know, helps people with mental health. So, and he also was talking about that and he was doing a bit of stories and stuff. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to tell my story publicly, in a sense, you know. So I set this up and uh, I was supported by, the, you know, the likes of the Spectrum Centre. And one of my, I didn't know this, now, but one of my friends was actually in marketing um, and, you know, does, is doing really well at that and actually put in a word with Belfast Life and actually put this, you know, my bit of my story. Belfast Life contacted me and I ended up then telling my story on Belfast Life um, and there was, you know, over 40 odd people turned up to this event, you know, to hear me and me and me and Brian talking. And I got a guy to, you know, facilitate and stuff like that, you know. And I'd done that for my 18th, you know, uh, in terms of being off the drink for, for, for 18 years as a wee way of giving back in a sense. Mm -hmm. What I didn't expect was three people, one of which has just come out of rehab there. There was a girl, um, I'm not, no names obviously, but she heard my story, wanted to meet up with me. We met up. Um, I'd spoke to her part of this deal here outside of, you know, um, and she then went into uh, a, a rehab and, and, and done her time in rehab. She contacted me there to get out. She was just telling me, you know, how well she's done. She's better, she, pff, unbelievable, unbelievable. Like, and you see that, that, like that, that sets then the hers in the back of my, not that there is any her, <laughs> but sets the hers in the back of my neck up, yeah. you know, that that's, that if, I'm, if I tell my story and people relate, you know, because there's not an awful lot of people out there telling their story and don't talk about this stuff. You know, I, I believe personally that if my story helps one person, which it already has, but I want I want to help more people. You know what I mean? I recently done, um, so my, my business is called the Recovery recovery and uh, Resilience Coach, Coaching. So I, um, part of that there is that I work with people, people contact me um, and they will, you know, work with me uh, initially and, and go on. People in the community have contacted me, phoned me, 
listen, I've struggled with this and that, you know, uh, I've got somebody who needs a wee bit of help. And over the last, you know, sort of six months, things have sort of taken a wee turn in, in, in a positive way. I, uh, and, and all this is happening, you know, full time, uh, not full time because I'm working full time, but this is all happening outside of my, outside of my work. Um, the other side of that is as well, is that I was, I don't know where, some people seem to, it's, it's, the word seems to be going out more I, I, and that's great. I, and I love that, you know, I don't mind talking about this, happy to talk to anybody if I can, I'll help them. But there was a, 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 a hostel that um, contacted me um, donkeys ago and they put, up, they put a wee leaflet and all up. But if you want to, if you want any of these photos, I'll send you them. But they put it up by name, obviously, Darren Linton, you know, young offender to life coach, you know. And I walked in, I walked into the hostel. That was for 18 to 24 year olds. Um, and there it was on the desk and they had wrote on it flat. Some wee, some, somebody had wrote on it flat to the mat with a party hat. And that was my, that was my, that was my thing for ages. You know what I mean? Flat to the mat with a party hat. You know, I just thought that was cracker. So, but what the, what the thing was, I said to the girl about, um, listen, sure, get a couple of pizzas. We'll bring the guys down, you know, I'll tell them a story and give them a bit of a, you know, could not go into too long. I can just probably gather I can talk, you know what I mean? Um, and it says, the girl says to me, the, 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 she said, listen, we'll give you the room. And all. she's got pizzas and a cup of coffees and all this. But, and I had the guys in the room. There was about maybe 10, 12 of them for the best part of 40 minutes. Um, and they, my story lasted 15 and, and, and I condensed it into... You know, talking about the punishment beatings, talking about you know military. You know, not everybody's going to like that military sort of, but addiction doesn't discriminate. Make no mistake of that; it doesn't discriminate. Um, so I don't mind saying that. So the girl at the end said to me, "Listen, you held them in there for longer than anybody. That was a, a record in the hostel." Now see the thing that came, and I'm I, I'm not going to say names and where the hostel is or whatever, but one of the things that really fed into what I'm doing as well in terms of I went for a grant are you found funding grant there um was in there 18 to 24 year olds which is when I was running about mad and the you know the military stuff and all every one of them as a matter of as be fair to say this right I'd be fair to say this because this will illustrate something that happened that I dealt with there and then I lucky enough we had another worker who was able to talk about it as well um the transgenerational trauma of these young people you know, that are, that are coming up now, you know, post-troubles, you know, very much like myself. I, thankfully, I'm okay talking about my stuff today. But when I opened the door to some of these guys, and I did say to the guys, the research would say that if you open the door, you've got to go back at a later stage and just go over, you know, making sure everybody's okay because you can open doors and, you know, you need to you need to deal with that in, in, in the proper way. So I had this all wired off with the, with the staff. Um, and that night, two members of that group, one on the one side of the community, one on the other, their family members, older family members, had been involved in something in, on the North Coast, which is a well-documented, you know, event, which was, you know, based on sectarian violence where people died and that. And this one was talking about this, what happened to... And, and it was just, it blew my socks off. And, and we went into it. We went, I said, listen, you know, you can't... Cause, one of them was going to blame the other one. And, you know, there was a whole... And it was just... It was just... It was so clear to me that we need to do more around this stuff. See, this transgenerational stuff. You know, there, there's more of that. The people... That, young people, it's coming down, you know. Um, we, and, touched, we touched on that. Yeah. And, see, I mean, the suicides. I mean, I... So, as a, as a when, when this... Sure, it's not that I didn't know it. I just when you see it in front of you, when you hear people talking about it, you know, and you, you recognise it, it's it's... It's scary, you know, if you're if you're on, but I but I want I want to get in amongst this a wee bit, you know. Um, so I went for a funding grant there not that long ago. I had explained that I was doing my recovery coaching, um, say on a Saturday and stuff like, and I had nowhere to go. I had nowhere to you know take them in, in a sense, and I didn't want to go to you know. I'm not saying any name because there's <laughs> you're like promoting them nearly, aren't you? Um, but I was going to like coffee shops and and places like that there where we're talking about some you know really hurry gnarly stuff, very much like I've talked about. You know, um, and I was say I was what I was doing then. I was getting like a flask of tea, or, or coffee or whatever it is, and sitting in the back of my car. My car is a you know, door at the back, and we we're sitting in the back. You know, and I was explaining this to them. I said, "I've nowhere to go," so I've beat a number of people in the UK, and I've got this funding grant, which has allowed me then to take this to you know a bit of a new level. Um, now, I mean, it's I explained to them in the in the thing. And I had to do like a panel discussion and stuff like that. Um, and they said to me, 
you know, that a majority of it was England and, and, and Wales and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I was explaining to them, this is, you know, and I went, in, I went into a few stats, part, part of the University of Ulster and when I was doing my degree, around multiple deprivation and, and all this sort of stuff that's that's there, that's in the in our communities, you know. Um, and I'd say to them that, you know, I want to do something about this, but I've nowhere to take them. As part of the funder grant, I wanted them to, you know, give me a, wooden, a garden office of some mm-hmm. description. So I... I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. They actually have given me this grant and I've got marketing and it's it's all happening. It's all going to happen. And, um, so, you know, it's, I can't believe the turnaround, but I'm I'm not stopping. You know, it's something that I believe deeply in. It's something that I really enjoy doing. You know, I love meeting really interesting. See, and I'm, the thing that I'm, that I really enjoy doing, and I think it comes from my timeshare days and my time in Tenerife. You know, I love going out speaking to people. I don't mind doing a podcast you know, thankfully I'm okay with my story today and any backlash that may come from it. Yeah. You know, it's been it's my story. It's it's there's no bullshit in this. It's straight up, this is the way it is. You know. Um so so yeah, so it's it's happening and I want to take this to the next level. You know, I'd love to do this full time, you know, but you know, it's um it's I feel that I'm doing an awful lot of stuff for free, but I don't mind. You know, a lot of stuff, I mean, I was brought into, um, was on, I put it on my social media. They allowed me to put it on my social media because a lot of the stuff that I have done will be outside of work in, you know, non nine to five hours. So, you know, I was I brought into uh, St. John's Ambulance Cadets and they wanted me to talk a wee bit about my story and emerging trends around substances and stuff like that. Now, these were all kids which were doing, a f- like, volunteering in their time. I, I just giving up their time to go and do, you know, ho- uh, festivals and stuff like that mm-hmm. there and provide a, a service, you know. Um, now, <laughs> I did say this to them and we had a bit of a laugh about it. You know, I was saying, listen, the way you guys are growing up is not the way I grew up. So forgive me if I use certain language and to talk about certain things that, you know, some people can be like, I can see it in them. You know, yeah. you know it's just sort of, you know, I'm, I'm used to that stuff. That's, the, you know, part of my deal in a sense, you know. But th- the conversations with these kids was just amazing, you know, Um and they wanted me to come down as well and speak to, you know, the the adults uh, and all this sort of stuff, you know. So it's just, um, I think there's a there's something there in the sense that, you know, I believe, and particularly around, you know, the recovery coaching side of things, that there's there's a bit of a something happening there around that, and people who have experience, are I believe are beneficial within these roles. You know, that's not to dismiss people who have read books and, you know, went to university and, and, and all that sort of stuff because they're as handy as w- as we are, in a sense. But some people do relate. Like that, I mean, if somebody went in there, you know, I'm not saying anything negative about anybody here, but if somebody went in there in terms of that the hostel that I went into and had a very posh accent and, you know, sitting with gold watches and stuff like that there or whatever, you know, and if, fuck this geezer, you know, I love it when they say that to me. I absolutely love it. What do you know? You're more relatable whenever you've lived it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've lived through that and you've come on your journey, which mm-hmm. you have, and I'm, I'm, I've listened to your whole story and I don't think you'd be where you're at now if you hadn't have wanted through all that. Mm-hmm. Is that fair to say? That would, that would be fair to say, you know, I, 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 would, I mean, I, I do find that, you know, I, I do I do get this. This is, this is a weird, this is a weird thing that happens, right? This is such a strange thing with, with all the sort of publicity that I've sort of got, not that there's an awful lot, but there's people, random people, will come and say to me, listen, um, I've seen you on Belfast Live, or I've seen you doing X, Y, and Z, and oh, that's brilliant, or whatever. But people who are really close to me, not in the fellowships or whatever, but people maybe I've worked with or whatever, not a word said. Not one of them has said a word. Now, that's okay, it's up to them. I'm not looking at anything from them either. But it just, it's just a strange thing. To, like, I was dropping my wee boy off to school, um, uh, who's who's I have a seven year old now to to my my nigh wife. Um, we're eleven years married, just for reference for any of young reasons. Um, but uh, I was dropping him up to school, and some of the mummies who were there dropping off their kids and my wee boys. Oh, I've seen you on Belfast, they were high five, man. Oh, well done, you, you know. And, you know, and I do get that now, where people would say to me, you know, the likes of uh, <laughs> that you, you you know you lived that story really, you know people. It's not that they don't believe it. It's just that I've changed so much yeah. that I'm no longer living like that. So when I talk about banging people with heavy radios and violence and drugs and all the crazy sex stuff and whatever else, you know, and I'm living today to the best of my ability and not making any more pasts, you know, that's a really positive thing. 
you yeah. know. And you, you talked on something there, and I will, I'll, I'll shut up after this, maybe you'll have a break. No, no, <laughs> and I, I broke because we've been engaged from the start, and yeah. I've gone ahead. So uh, just in terms of, you said something there that sort of, it didn't make me feel uncomfortable, but it made me go, you know, it'd be fair to talk about this stuff. So throughout my drinking and drugging and my exploits, you know, I have done a lot of things and I am so ashamed of, you know, thankfully today I don't beat myself up. I have forgiven myself. But I'll never forget, you know, where I where I come from, you know, and what I've done. There's, I got to make, so within the, the 12 step recovery programs, there's a, a part of that where you can make amends to people, okay? And I've made amends, you know, I have made amends. If we're going to talk about the negative, then we might as well talk about the love, okay? Some people might want to hear about banging people with radios and jails and all that stuff. But showing people love is, is, a, is another side of that. And it's an expression that I struggled with, but today I'm okay with, you know? I, for my mother, my mother, um, like I said, passed away a couple of years ago. Before she did, my mother lived in England uh, before me and my younger brothers were born. Um, and as a way of men's, I done something for my mum. She she would always talk about when she lived there, she had a couple of miscarriages. Um, and, I, and I spoke about this at her funeral and stuff. Um, not not this story, but, you know, in terms of the five children that she had, two of which are with her today. Um, so when she, she always wanted to know where they were, because when, they, when she, they passed away, whatever, I'm not sure how it happened, but they were buried in, in, in England. So one day I had to say, and she talked about this, and it used to, you know, cause her a bit of pain and stuff. And my God, that I must have caused that woman a lot of pain. So I was like, you know something, I'm going to do something really, you know, I'm going to try and find these these kids. And that's exactly what I've done. And I was absolutely blessed. I got on the phone and I started ringing around. I knew the story of my my mum's hut, where it was and this sort of stuff. And I got on to a cemetery and I was talking to a cemetery and I said to the, that was a real brummy girl, and I said, listen, and I give her the details and, and all this sort of stuff. And she says, oh, yes, they're down in the, and they told me where they were. Um, and I explained to them. One was, uh, they give me the names, no point saying names and stuff like that there, but they give me the names um, and they, so they, they had the names, my, my second name, Linton, and their first names. And they also had a, like a, like a number, like, like 1A, B, whatever it was. I had, you know, this is a wee, this is quite some time ago now. Um, and I, wrote all this down and stuff and, and I went in and I gave it to my mum and I said, listen, you know, I want you to know something, mummy, that I'm... <sighs> I can't believe I was so emotional about that, but that was something that's, that's, for me, to cause that much pain to her at that, you know, through my acrobats and the worry I must have called that girl, you know, I went in and I said, listen, mom, I want you to know something. I'm sincerely sorry for what I've done. I'm really sorry, you know, I don't want you to ever think of me like that again. I hope that I never go through that again. And I handed her that and she, she didn't know what to do. She just genuinely didn't know what to do. She didn't know how to hug me. She didn't know how to cry. Long story short, you know, um, she told my dad as well. Um, and he also then, he, he, he made it his mission to get over to where they were. And there's a, there's a beautiful photo I have in my house where my mum is bending down beside the two graves and she's put wee markers on the graves. And that was, see that? That's one of the most, and that's one of the most higher, you know, amenses that I've ever made, you know, um, in, in terms of, you know, when you come into these programmes and you start doing better than what you're doing, it's, it, for me, when you heal and to not take any, for me, now this is all for me, not to take any more drink and not live that way of life, you've got to be living better. You've got to be giving back. You know, it's it's not always about me. We talk about in the recovery program about the isms, you know, I, self and me, you know. Um, and I just want to do better than than and I genuinely do, you know. Um I will say there was a I'll, I'll give you a bit of a laugh, actually. Maybe this isn't funny, but to me it is. Um my son still lives in Tenerife. Um and her, where he lives is not far from where I used to live and all the all the madness and all that was going on, you know. Um and I had a name where I lived. Uh, it was it was called uh, I was called Psycho Daz. Used to call me Psycho Daz, right? A couple I, of drinks. I wonder why. <laughs> so, yeah, you know. And it's just you know the laugh. Can't help but like think how they laugh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So long story short, anyway, um, I there's a bar that I go into, uh, and I used to play. It was one of the bars with the football. We all used to go. We'd play football out there. Um, 
and I went in and I, had a, I was having a, a Fanta orange. But I'll never forget this. Whenever I ordered a drink, and it's been a long time since I was in this, it's nice, it's donkeys ago. But whenever I went in and ordered a drink, right, maybe it was the first time, you know, some of them had seen me for quite some time, didn't realise that I was not drinking in the way I was living. They still see me as this psycho dog. So I went in and left and, and ordered a Fanta orange. And I seen everybody looking to see what I was what I was putting into the drink. <laughs> oh my God. You know, um, and there was there's there was a couple out there. Um, there was a couple out there as well that I was in a drink one night and I just took a bit of a psycho attack. You know, and you know, emptied these two guys. I'm a male and a female. I hit the I hit the male with a case of uh, empty bottles of Coca Cola and stuff. You know, and <sighs> man, you know, and that's you know what I mean. This is the sort of stuff that I'm dealing with. You know, and but I bumped into them that day, um, and the first time I seen them, I have to say I bottled it. I didn't want to. But I was like, I wasn't live, I, where I was staying. I wasn't staying that far away. So I was like, right, g myself up. And I'm going to say to these guys, you know, listen, I'm really sorry. And I wanted to just, you know, show me my, because I'm a different person today and thank God for it. But I, uh, they were walking down the, towards the bus stop and I and I crossed the street over to them. And I seen the two of them. <laughs> Do you know that? Because it's still, and it's, I, I, like I say, I'm, I laugh and giggle and stuff like that, but it's not funny at all, you know. But I said to the two of them, listen, um, I'm really sorry. I want you to know that, you know, that night I was I was angry. It wasn't you guys, you know. Um, and, and the girl actually gave me a hug. I couldn't believe that. Sean, I couldn't believe that. The girl gave me a hug. And, and she probably got the worst of it, to be fair, you know. Um, and she gave me a hug and she says, listen, I'm, I'm really glad you said that to us. You know, so, and there's, and there's been many stories like that. And in terms of the way I live today, and doing this sort of stuff, this is like an amends for all the crazy that has happened. I want to do better. You know, there are people out there who will be watching this who are struggling, wanting to do stuff for their parents. You know, the, the, the guilt, the shame and the remorse you feel when you're involved in addiction is, you know, it's just, it's... Uh, the only way I've... Uh, there's a thing that I read, right, um, and it talks about... I, I love I love Northern Ireland. I love the stories, the legacy, and undercover agents, and all. I love all that stuff. I love reading about it, and, and haven't read enough a lot of it recently because I've been doing our stuff. But there was a time I went through a stage, which was just loving all that. And there was a there was a part of it that was talking about British soldiers in South Armagh, um, and at, at the at the beginning of the troubles, and it talks about there somebody would have put like grated glass into a flask of tea and then handed it to them. So obviously when they were drinking the tea, then it was going through their system and, you know, you can just imagine how that. And I imagine the pain of that to be how I have felt around some of the things that I have done, you know, particularly that falling asleep my wee boy and other things like that. Do you know what I mean? That's the closest I think I've ever seen or came to in terms of the pain that you can feel, you know. And emotional pain, I'd rather I'd rather have, uh, I think I'd rather have a punishment beaten than, than somebody regurgitate that information to me now I've have I have had that happen to me and you know people have held me to account and and that's okay they're entitled to their view but uh, today I've dealt with it today I've dealt with it you know I'm okay with my story today hence I'm you know I'm here on a podcast yeah. talking about it and, it and I don't mind talking about it today you know because like I say if it helps somebody else somebody out there goes you know what I need to get on the phone with this geezer you know he knows what he's talking about or there's, whatever else there's, there's no doubt in my mind, that people will have related. I I, I relate to you, Dor. You talking to me and Sean, I've been gripped and engrossed in your story. Mm-hmm. There's, and I, yes, I did point out some of the things because I didn't want people to think that we do this. I wanted people to know that I'm going to tell you what I think is a big man and what's brave. Somebody that can sit there and tell warts and all. People glamorize things all the time. Yeah. And you see these people on online for attention. They're glamorizing past and stuff like that. It's not that. It wasn't glamorous. It wasn't good. And you've reflected on that. And and it's so... Anybody out there that have done things they're not ashamed of, it's so nice to see that you're at a point where you forgive yourself and making amends. And you speak about making amends. I don't think... And that for your mum, that was... It was touching... I don't think that was the greatest man's you made for your mum. I think changing your life to doing this mm. was the greatest man's you've made for her. That's a good point. You're yeah. going to go on and make her proud. You're going to go and stop people on the destructive path that they're on. They're going to hurt other people. All this happened before. It's not It's not good. But it's all led you. Sean said it. It's all led you to be able to be there now saying something that isn't 
university educated and well obviously you've went back for your education but what I mean is it's real life mm -hmm. this is it I felt that pain I felt that humiliation I felt that that shame but look where my life is now yeah. I have my wife I have my child my children and and here I am now helping people and we're, none of us are the people not all like not to the extent of what you've said but we all have a past and we've all done things. And we're, none of us are the person we were 20 years ago. Yeah, 100%. We're, you know, and pe people stay the same person. And, and that's not growth. Growth is seeing who you were, changing how you were, addressing things. And I I, I really enjoyed listening to this. Not all, all of that. And, and I didn't want to push you in that or say that I, I was trying to trick you. But I did want people to know that there, there, there was parts of that, and and they may be in the same place as you, mm -hmm. where they're they are ashamed of parts of what they how they made other people feel, but it's okay to start healing and start forgiving yourself and start and people might think you you have to forgive yourself first before you can make any of that. Hundred percent, yeah. You, there's, there's so many people out there that uh, you know I've came across who you know are helping people to distract themselves from the pain yeah. that they're feeling. Yeah. And and that can have a detrimental effect in terms of, you know, what's going on and stuff like that, you know. Um so that's that's a fair point. I, I will I'll share this just for the for the the, the most recent thing that I've done there and I, and I, and this has opened up a, a wee avenue which I mean I never thought this was, you know, going to be something that would have came my way. More so because how I felt about it, you know. So in terms of my military career, I'm considered a veteran. <laughs> I struggle with that word. I don't see. I thought yeah, if you're a veteran, you have to have medals and all this sort of stuff and all. I didn't get any. I got a march and shoot medal. I think you know. Um, long story short, I was up in like I say McGilligan. I networked with a guy up there who asked me to go into McGabry. Um, which you know was unreal for me to be asked. Um, he and is he, what he told me was now factually accurate. I don't know, but. What I do know is that this is legit within the prison system, that there are, you know, 5% in the UK of prisoners in UK in, uh, in, in prisons are ex-veterans, are ex-soldiers, whatever Jesus. they are, you know. Which, that's which, quite a big that, representation that shocked of that. That shocked the life out of me, right? Shocked the life out of me. So he had said to me, listen, I believe you, you're an ex-soldier. He says, how would you feel about coming in and speaking to some of these guys? I was like, not a problem, mate, you know. And I went in... Um, in the McGarry, I was telling them a story about the elbows, and they were all in stitches, 13 of them in that room. And a lot of the stories they were talking about, you want to hear some of the... And, and I love, I don't mind telling my story, but I also want engagement. I want to be able to talk to them and, and, and help them and show, listen, you know, what do you think about this and whatever. And we had another... It was a... Well, well that's a, that's a, there's a mad story, but that's maybe for a, maybe later down the line in the sense of this, but they all, they all recognise this. They talked about, you know, if, when I said about I was, um, I my sentence reduced because I was I lost a career. Some of them in there also identified with that. You know, some of them were talking about the struggles when they get out, that the likes of, you know, they're supporting people. I'm not name any organisation, obviously, but they were saying that these guys are trained killers. They are, they're violent and aggressive and they don't know. And I was I challenged every one of them. I said, I'll tell you what it is, lads. And I, I done this with we exercise with their with their with their arms. And I, and one of my I have a cup that I have and I, I on my a wee slogan that I just love, you know, um nothing grows in a comfort zone, you know. And I, I, there's a wee exercise that I've done with them and I was saying to them that I says for me and, and, and they all identified with it, I says, for me, I could go out now and I could hit you a dig in the bake and it wouldn't cost me a second thought. I says, but you try and sit with some of your feelings. You try and sit and try and forgive someone. You sit there and try and... And I illustrate it with something that had happened in my life, and I, I don't mind sharing that either. Um, but he all... Every one of them identified with that. When they... Some of them have, were getting out, and some of them were talking about, you know, the struggles. So if you're... If you've, if you've got a sentence um, and you have probation when you get out, you have to have an address. But if you don't, you just get out. And that's it. Away you go. You're, you know, see you later. Which, for me, is really wrong. So if you've got addiction issues... Ideally, I would love, and how that's going to happen or why that's going to happen or when that will happen, I would love, you know, anybody getting into prison with addiction issues to have some sort of coach beside them or something like that. That's something I would love to do, you know. But particularly with veterans, you know, there's something about that there that, 
you know, these guys are, you know, there's, there's, there's so many issues that have that have come across, and there's a couple of things that have came my way now, you know, because I have that. And the guy actually said to me, the guy who brought me in said to me, listen, he says you want to put that to bed because it's still it's still a tinge of my I feel in my character, you know, I fucked that all up. You know, so dealing with that. But when I was talking to them, I was able to help them. So there's a wee amends there for me. You know, hi, I'm going to help these guys. I give every one of them a wee card. I just say, listen, give me a ring when you get out. I don't know what I can do for you. I don't know how I'm going to help you, but give me a bell, you know. And there's a number of wee things that's come out of that now as well, you know. Um, so there's, so the more I, I stick my head above the parapet, the more stuff seems to be coming my way, you know. Now, at the same time, I've got to be very mindful of the fact that I have a family and a job and a mortgage. You know, as much as I love this stuff, there has to be a, a turn-off point. You know, I never do this in my work. Do you know what I mean? I never do it. I have to turn my phone off and stuff like that because it can just be distracting to me. Um, but but I'm, the weekends and different things, and there's different things going on and stuff like that that, that I just, you know, I'll be, I'll be involved in, you know. But there's a lot of the questions that I have and what I would get is, you don't drink? You don't take drugs? How do you relax? And and, and there's, a, there's something about that as well that I find that an awful lot of people just don't know how to do it. And I, I some of the things that I love, you know, I know, I know you've had a guy on here, um, a, a big businessman, and uh, I've heard him a couple of times, and, and I love, he talks about getting up early in the morning and mantras, and, 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 and I'm like that. I get up early in the morning and I talk about it and read, and, and, and that's, you know, something that I, I love podcasts. I love being listening to podcasts, you know. Um, I love sea swimming. I love the outdoors. I at one point was a mountain bike leader in one of my youth things. I got the qualification, and I used to do. I used to love taking some of the young people out to the likes of Castle Wallen Forest Park, and there's a big track around there. And I would have stopped at a point where they had no idea where they were, and I'd have got to be fire lit and you know cooked a few schmoors and all that sort of stuff, and had a bit of. But what they didn't realise was they'd see outside of that environment. I could sit in a room, I guess, with them, and we could talk on. And some of them don't want to talk to you, you know. Men don't talk, you know, face to face in a sense, you know. A lot of them talk shoulder to shoulder, mm -hmm. and and that's particularly with young people. You know, I love I love all that sort of stuff. You know, that's stuff that I just I've, I've incorporated into my work. You know, it's really hard for men to talk, but if you create environments and and that sort of thing, and that that really works. You know, that really works. So where that goes, I don't know, and how long it's going to take. But this for me is a lifetime thing. This is something I want to do over. Would like to do it full time at some point. One hundred and ten percent. You know, do I have to be mindful of the fact that I'm, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm doing for free and not being, and I'm not being paid for some of the stuff. But I hope that changes. You know, somewhere along the line, I hope that changes. You know, so, um, so yeah. It's been brilliant, Darren. It's uh, look, listen, far play to you. I've enjoyed it. I've loved listening to your story. I, uh, I I was actually excited to get you on, and then whenever I was reading through bits and bobs that you had sent through, I was like, I can't wait now because I was so intrigued. Yeah, and now I've heard it all. And uh, it's also nice to meet someone that can talk as much as me. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, that that's, that's 100%. Uh, definitely 100% there. Like, you know, it's Darn. probably got me to shut up one time, is it? Uh, <laughs> Darn, yeah, I wish you all the best. And if I was in the health directorate, I would 100% fund it because I would see more good coming out of that than some of the schemes they do. But look, Darn. Uh, we'll touch on with you again and we'll link in anybody that's watching this we'll also link in darn socials and um, so if you're if you're experiencing that uh, we'll also link in a couple of other we'll, we'll just uh, we'll discuss the services we'll link in a few others that we can link in and anybody's in that in uh, anywhere in that journey they can reach out and you can we can help them or uh, in any way we, hopefully that's what good comes with but darn thank you very much for coming up today thank you for having me guys it's really you know, great to, to come in and, and share that story and, and all the positive stuff that's going on. And can I just say, if there is anybody out there, you know, that is watching, you know, feel free to contact me, you know, or reach out for help. There is help there. I work in that world. There is people out there that can't and will help you. You know, it's just, you know, taking that first step. You have to want it. Yeah. You know? So so thanks very much, lads. I appreciate it. Darren, thank you very much. Thank you.